live now. <clears throat> Can you guys hear us fine? I'm not sure if this two mic setup's working. Can you try talking, Ryan? Sure. Hello. Can you guys hear both of us? Am I audible? A little quiet. Should I get closer? Is that better? Uh, oh, actually, if it's quiet, it's a little quiet. Let me raise the game. What about now? We can hear you great, but no, Ryan is quiet. Let's see if I can improve. Yeah, that I might a just bit. need to bring it in closer. chat say you're good now hello can you guys hear us fine too it's loud too much now oh it's too much now too much i will lower can you both exchange glasses i don't think our prescriptions are the same <laughs> uh picking up some fan noise you are loud ryan is soft please trade um hold on Why would Ryan be soft? Is there a... No. Hold on, hold on, sorry. I've never done a two mic setup like this before. Can you try talking, Ryan? Sure. Is that this is better me for talking Ryan? now? Hello? Learning about Ryan is good? audio levels. Very good. It's great. Okay, we're good now? Both of us sound good? Okay. That's perfect? Nice. He sound fine? Nice. I love the ILM sh What is ILM sh Oh, yes. This is Industrial Light and Magic. For anyone who hasn't seen the new documentary oh, about right, ILM, right. Oh, I highly, yeah, okay. highly, highly recommend it. It's like my favorite <laughs> thing or documentary in years. Absolutely wonderful. I think Ryan's... Oh, I think your just mic needs to be physically closer. No, I do not use a cloud lifter for this sm7b is this the maximum gain my yeah that's the most gain this will get okay we'll let people trickle in a little bit but yeah we have mr ryan here with us today uh we're going to be premiering a short film produced by ryan norbar and then we'll have a I guess it was actually, session? strictly speaking, in Hollywood parlance, it was produced by my friend, our mutual friend, I believe. Uh, oh, that's right, that's right. Uh, Shin, uh, otherwise known as Japanese horror writer. I was the director and writer of this. Right. He doesn't stop by streams anymore. <laughs> yeah, he's been otherwise he occupied of yeah. late, unfortunately. Uh, yum, oh, Yumcha. That's uh, Andy. Yeah, I know Andy, oh, okay. of course. And, he says and hi. It's, it's a rare part. I, I think... It is often the case that I know many people who are here, but I don't recognize you probably by your, uh, your internet <laughs> oh, handle. We have Miss but... Cookie Curls in chat too. Hello. Uh, saw the Sunset Boulevard SS? Stainless steel. You can get Sunset Boulevard with stainless steel? We made one of them, and the, I think it's currently in the shop. And that's so you what coat that over. They're talking about. You powder coat over the stainless steel. That's right. So um, you get it. It just looks like an aluminum one, but if you go to lift it, it's extraordinarily. Hey, Garrett. I see. I see. Um, it's oh, extraordinarily heavy. Hello. Are you back from the, your trip? Your trip yet? I'm guessing this is Garrett. I'm typing on one of your aerospace heavy girls from the Nor Bazaar sale. Nice. Excellent. I would say a good amount of my viewers are into Norbar products. <laughs> Did you want to start with the premiering first, or? It's at your discretion, your stream. You're the professional is, Twitch this is your, person here. This is your video premiere, though. <laughs> um, we'll still let people trickle in. Twitch has been a little slow with alerting viewers, so. 
And sorry if I don't get to alerts today, as I'll be just talking with Ryan. But thank you to everyone who's been subscribing. Oh wait, Devin's Devin's here too. Devin, thank you for the 19 months. Omnitype with the 46. Thank you, thank you. I don't know if you're still here, Devin, but Mr. Ryan will be helping out with your board. Yeah, it sounds like an interesting project. Oh, I, like I will play the jingle for you. How about that? Sounds good. It's not fully retro futurism vibes, but it, I could see it working. Just it, retro works for me frequently. Just retro? Okay, this is the jingle produced by Mr. Devin Morrison for me. This is very moonlighting. Moonlighting? What yeah. Is oh, you're not familiar with moonlighting? It's the best television show in the history <laughs> oh, of okay. American culture. <laughs> I can That's see fantastic. This, I can see this working in a retro futuristic. That's thing. very eighties. I really like it a lot. Yeah, like I said, it's uh, it really strongly is giving me uh, moonlighting vibes. Um, yeah, I guess I'll have to watch moonlighting. Now. <laughs> uh, I'm not sh honestly sure I could fully recommend it. The show is oh. completely ridiculous, but um, it's very eighties. You know, it's so uh, it had uh, Sybil Shepherd and um, Bruce Willis were the stars of the mm. show, um, and it's like. The, the interesting thing about the show is it, it was very sort of uh, revolutionary in television in that they were constantly breaking the fourth wall and like talking to the audience. And mm -hmm. it was very like recursive and self-referential and silly. It originally started out as just like a sort of standard kind of uh, detective agency show, right? Okay. Uh, with, with some like romantic tension between the two lead characters. But slowly, they just they started throwing in these little like nods to the audience and self-aware references, and then the show just oh, okay. like became consumed by that. And I think that was the first time that had ever happened in television. So but, a lot uh, of like breaking the fourth wall. Yeah, stuff yeah, happening. exactly. Um, but it had this really excellent sort of opening credit song by someone named Al Jarreau, um, who uh, it has this sort of very similar kind of like nineteen eighties. Okay. I don't know what the term is for that genre, but I, I really love it. It sort of calls back to my youth. I think it's it, one of my, uh, probably my earliest memory in my entire life is lying on the floor of my parents' bedroom watching Moonlighting. Huh. So I have like this strong, oh, positive association. Who, I have yeah, no, no idea doubt, no doubt. Jerome, it looks like Devin knows who you're talking about. <laughs> I was just listening to some of his music last night, actually. Um, oh, okay. A nice, lot of nice. interesting stuff. I like it a lot. Yeah. Nice. And now you got to listen to Devin's music on the drive home. Absolutely. <laughs> um, just got ads. Okay, I'll we'll wait two minutes, one thirty, and then we'll premiere the video. But yeah, think of questions you guys want to ask Ryan afterwards. We're just gonna hang out, no build today. But Ryan's an open, mostly an open book as long as he's allowed to talk. About I'd say, it, so. I, please impress me with the extreme openness of your questions I, i'll if i'll be astonished if you can find one that i'm unwilling to answer <laughs> jason, jason hello what was the documentary you mentioned earlier oh right uh, that was Mark. i think it's just called light and magic uh, about um, industrial light and magic it's on disney plus oh, disney plus yeah so good it's like i i often describe it as a you know a six part or maybe five or six parts documentary about project management <laughs> which sounds really exciting i know but it's um it's like they go so so deep into like nerdy technical details about the visual effects industry, but also sort of telling the history of how hard it is to do creative projects in a way that most people who consume the end creative project never really get the slightest inkling of, right? So like they talk about all of the pain that went into making the first Star Wars film and all of the, the, the struggles getting the VFX right for it. Um, and as someone who sort of works on these very long-term projects, obviously in a much more modest scale, but nevertheless, um, projects that have a lot of, like have some creative elements and a lot of technical complexity to them. And everything always ends up taking way longer than you think and it being much more complicated than you think. Um, so much of that documentary resonated with me. And I, I just loved how 
willing the creators were to go really deep into details that most people would probably find uh, sort of arcane. And it's just, it's a super nerdy documentary, but I loved it. And I loved how super nerdy it was. Whoa, is that true? Omnitype bought every single design from Norbar in both Veracity Steel and Polycarb. <laughs> That's a lot of <laughs> Topra boards. <laughs> you know, there's, uh, he's definitely one of our hardcore supporters. There are a few people. You know someone that builds keyboards. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Send them back to Jared and he'll build them for you. I'm sure at a very reasonable hourly rate. Okay, it is now 1.30. Do you want to like have a precursor to this video or should I just go right into it? Uh, uh, yeah, sure, play it. It's a, by way of background, I wanted to make a video. So I'm always asked like, um, you know, what do you do? What's your job? And uh, I say, well, I make, I make fancy keyboards. And people frequently are puzzled by that answer in the first place. And especially when they learn the details that there are people who, you know, uh, sign up to pre-orders that might take 16 months to ship um, and keep, you know, will custom order bespoke keyboards for me that are like $4,000. Um, and this, this is puzzling to people why a person should care so much about such a seemingly ordinary mundane object. Uh, and so for a long time, I wanted to make a little video that's kind of a sort of answer to that, which is why, at least for me personally, the keyboard is more than just a utilitarian thing, but is a sort of sentimental object and why it sort of is significant to me. And so I spent three years <laughs> attempting to do, uh, to make something that sort of expressed my feelings about that. And that's what the video is. Okay. You guys are getting the first premiere ever. Here we go. Do you remember the future? The second half of the 20th. Wait, no, no, no. Audio skipping? Hold on. Why is audio skipping? Um. Okay, maybe. Hold on, hold on. Because I just I have this in OBS. Maybe I'll just play it and then share my monitor. It is a pretty hefty video. Can VLC not handle this? Audio skipping? Okay, hold on, hold on. Let me try this. Uh, I'm going to turn off all the overlays. Okay, hopefully this works. Are you playing the 4K version? Yes, this is the 4K version. Oh, crap.
Right, that was the video premiere. Thoughts, questions, concerns, comments? How can I share that? Um, this I just be... I just flipped it on on my YouTube channel now. Oh. So if you just go to you know Google Norbauer or YouTube or something, it'll be the first thing I think. Yeah, it should be up on Mr. Norbauer's uh, YouTube channel. And if you liked the soundtrack, it's available to stream on all the major streaming platforms. I think. Yeah, it's already. on Spotify and iTunes and probably other things. There's also actually if um, I think if you search for Forgotten Futures in YouTube and add A M A R, which is the last name of the composer Armand Damar, um, it, you can get a just you know, audio version of the music on his channel. Uh, he's an amazing composer, and I feel very fortunate to work to have been able to work with him. Um, he's based in Paris. Mod Musings, hello. The score is such a highlight, very, very pretty. Yeah, do you actually want to talk about it? Because I know that was a huge, that was probably like the biggest, one of the biggest portions of the video, I feel like. Well, I mean, <laughs> everything, it's as I was talking about before regarding the ILM documentary, Every time you turn a corner in a project, you never know how big that little part is going to be. Mm -hmm. And I just like, I'm always saying, you know, all projects seem for 90% of their duration, like they're 90% done, you know? <laughs> uh, and that was certainly true with this video. I'm like, cause you know, so the way this usually works, it's called scoring to picture, right? So you, you finish all of the editing first. Uh, that's oh. the way it's done with Hollywood films generally. Uh, and then the last thing you do is you hand it off to the composer and the composer, uh, you know, makes the musical beach, beats match up with the cuts and emotional beats of the mm -hmm. film. Uh, so I had this this edit done many months ago, and I wanted to get some good music for it rather than just using stock music like I usually do. Uh, and I spoke to uh, a number of potential composers for it, um, but and uh, I I had always loved Armand de Mar's work. He's uh, he does um, particularly for French documentaries these really um, interesting compositions that combine all sorts of like what might be described as world music, right? So uh, lots of elements from different cultures around the world into compositions that have traditional like Western symphonic, you know, like melodies in them. Uh, and then they're paired with a lot of documentaries that have voiceover narration. So, uh, you know, it's like simultaneously an interesting, memorable melody, but that doesn't compete with and drown out the narrator. So he was like the perfect person for this, and I'd always wanted to to work with him, but um, I kind of was nervous to even approach him because I thought he would be like fantastically too expensive or not interested in working with such a small project as mine. Um, so I explored all these other composers uh, and finally sort of in exasperation at the exorbitant cost or sort of slow response time or whatever of these composers i was just like okay whatever the hell i'll just i'll send him an email and see what he says <laughs> and he was you know he responded in like six hours He's like it sounds amazing i would lo be, love to help right um and uh you know the price he quoted me was very reasonable uh, especially for someone of his talent and skills and uh you know uh in a couple of months he turned that out mm. it was kind of amazing the um when he sent me the first this the mock-up uh, it could easily have been the finished piece it was just was like, that the video that Jared and I saw or yeah I think you I mean, saw an early sort of mock-up version right. and that's yeah. just like something he just kind of casually threw together in his music studio mm -hmm. um and uh and, he, and I was like okay great we're done and he was like no what are, what are you talking about we're gonna we're gonna record this with a 30-piece <laughs> orchestra that was just the mock-up <laughs> um so in short Armand de Mar is amazing and I'm very fortunate to have you know uh worked up the courage to send him an email to ask if he'd be willing to work with me yeah, and um, if if actually, I highly recommend just exploring his other music on Spotify. Like I, this amazing song called "Cum Dederit" from um, "Cum Dederit." Cum Dederit. Yeah, type it's that out Latin, for chat. sure. Uh, it's probably the most um, popular song that he's created on Spotify. So if you sort of sort songs um, by popularity, it'd probably be the first thing that came up. It's from this documentary called "Home," um, um, which in the US was uh, narrated by Glenn Close, but it's originally a French documentary with French narration, but it was eventually released here. And I think it has the best music that he's made uh, right. by far. Yeah, we were actually supposed to go to Paris to actually film like the live recording session with Norbar in the shot. I was supposed to help film some of the BTS footage for that, but. That was the original concept, but yeah. uh, instead we're just premiering this here today yeah. in Torrance, California. <laughs> um, yeah, but I don't know if you guys noticed some of the shots. Um, 
some of the shots were used in my interview with Ryan. Um, when when was the Seattle meetup when we went to the center? It's uh, 2019, really sort of a, just a few months before COVID began. Yeah, that was uh, before was, the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, so it's uh, it took me for one minute of footage, it took me one year of production time <laughs> to make this film. Yeah. Um, that was, of course, not all active time working on it, but mm. uh, nevertheless, in calendar time, that's how, how long it took. And so, yeah, um, you shot a lot of it at the Computer History Museum in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, someone, yeah, correctly guessed that that's where that was. Yeah. Uh, there's also this, uh, so alas, that's not my house. <laughs> that is a house in the middle that's of the desert <laughs> in Joshua Tree. I live in Los Angeles. Um, I wish I lived in the desert in, in a way, but I think it would be extremely boring to live in this house most of the time, but it is very beautiful. Um, and uh, there, uh, in the credits, it is the name of the house. And if you want to stay there, it's like an Airbnb. You can actually just go stay there. Um, <laughs> it so. is one of my goals. After yeah. Ever since she linked me that Airbnb listing, I'm like, one day I will host a party there. Yeah, it's pretty great, actually. Because <laughs> um, when you're when you're on the property, if you look all around, you can't see any other signs of human habitation at all, except like very far in the distance. I think you can see mm -hmm. the city of Palm Desert. No, or no Palm neighbors Springs or in something. that area. No. Oh. Um, they, they, you know, 10 minute drive or something in either direction, okay. but you actually can't see them from the property. And mm -hmm. so you really do just feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. Wow. Yeah. So it's actually a little, it's kind of scary at night. <laughs> you just, <laughs> you just feel like... Especially with um, all those glass windows. Yeah, yeah. Something... <laughs> I've never had that experience before. Mm. Of, um, it's like this old Edward Hopper painting of a house uh, on the edge of... It's like somewhere in the prairie or something and on the edge of a forest. And uh, something very terrifying to me about that. I think it's kind of like a <laughs> horror movie trope too, right? You know? Yeah. Of just like being in the little cottage in the woods <laughs> away from all of civilization. Yeah. That's crazy though, because we. I mean, Coyotes, one of the exactly. one of the major um, reasons for going to that Seattle meetup was to specifically get footage for your video. Yes, so, so. It, that was called the Living uh, Computers <clears throat> Museum, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Living Computer History Museum, something like that. Yeah. At any rate, sadly, that museum is no more. COVID oh, got they closed it. That? Yes, because oh. uh, they, you know, they obviously couldn't. The whole premise of that museum. And what made it so special, I think, essentially unique in the world for a, mm. a major public museum is unlike the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley, um, you can actually touch and use the computers. The right. whole idea was for you to physically interact with them. But of course, yeah. this was not a very COVID friendly activity. Mm. So they were closed for a really long time, uh, depriving them of all their normal source of revenue. And, you know, this was enormously destabilizing to the museum. And I think they just they couldn't survive it. Um, so we were like among the last people to ever go to that wow, museum, that's crazy. sadly, <laughs> um, but it was amazing. They had a Xerox Alto, right? So this yeah. Xerox Alto is featured prominently in this, uh, in this, this video in a number of spots. And it's, it's essentially the first personal computer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Jobs liberally borrowed from it in the creation of the Mac and sort of the, the, the whole concept of a GUI driven desktop operating system. Right. Um, there are like 10 of these in the world and you could just go to that museum and use it, type on it, right? right. It's amazing. And they even uh, had the old like punch card style, like yeah, I, the whole I, thing. I forget the terminology um, for it, but yeah, just punch cards. That's oh, right. Punch cards, old yeah. IBM punch card like systems. You can physically like type. You a can type your own card. Getting punched right. out. Yeah. yeah. Um, in fact, there there is the shot right before it fades to black. I'm typing. Uh, there's kind of like a side shot of me on oh, the keyboard, right. and that's actually I'm typing on one of the. So at with each keystroke, a, a hole is being punched in the card, on that IBM keyboard. Super cool. I think in my interview with you, I have the shot of the how like the you paper do. gets passed along and yep. drops down into the bins. Yeah, yeah. Norbar giving me Steve Jobs vibes. <laughs> For better or worse, I get that pretty often. <laughs> do you know what happened to all the machines then that were in the museum? I don't know. Uh, so I think you know someone. Uh, the major benefactor of that museum was someone from Microsoft, hmm. uh, one of the early. Uh, founders of the company or early employees who was, of course, now fantastically wealthy. Um, so I don't know if those technically personally belong to the person, the guy who founded it. I don't remember which of the Microsoft people it was. Um, or if it was um, like a nonprofit that owned them. But mm -hmm. I, I presume they're in storage somewhere. Or even maybe the building is still there, but they just can't afford to operate it or something. I don't oh, know. Okay. I don't think it's possibly Paul Allen. I don't think it was Steve Ballmer. 
Also, did anyone recognize the narrator's voice? That was also someone that Norbar heavily wanted to narrate for. Yes. So that yes, that <laughs> oh, was. Oh, Mr. Koopa uh, got it. Wow. <laughs> it was Tuvok from oh, Star cheated. Trek Voyager. Uh, I did. I think I mentioned that in my newsletter. Oh, okay, that, okay. So, um, <laughs> he's also credited but uh <clears throat> yeah so he was actually extremely fun to work with and he was very he had never heard of this concept of a fancy <laughs> keyboard and was very interested in it and uh the uh we just we recorded it at a studio in hollywood just like 10 minutes from each of our houses and it's just very uh it was a very cool la experience <laughs> um, shin helped me arrange it uh and uh it's kind of it's I explored various other Star Trek actors who are sort of a bit more famous, and they wanted ex like unbelievable amounts of money <laughs> to do it. Um, and like, I would just, I would be embarrassed to say the amount of, to, for, for their, to save their face, I will not say the amount of money that some people wanted That's to do fair. it. Um, but actually, it, uh, I will say Tim Russ was much more affordable. <laughs> um, and, uh, but in many ways, it was actually the ideal person for me so I'm not a very good like narrator or voice actor. So I tried recording it and I just was never happy with it. Obviously it would be better because it's like, they're my words, um, be better coming from me, but I just couldn't like credibly oh. do it. I, it just sounded very hokey to me. So I wanted to get a, a professional actor. And I, in many ways, Tuvok is perfect for me because I sort of like the voice of myself I hear in my head is basically Tuvok <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> You know, you know, Tuvok is, is, uh, he's, is that the he's, voice he's, you're thinking? in a way, yeah, <laughs> okay. it, it, it fits, you know, so he's very like, uh, he's the first true Vulcan in Star Trek. There's, you know, Spock was famously a Vulcan, but he's actually half uh, human, half Vulcan. Right. And so he has this sort of, uh, internal tension in him and he has a certain kind of emotionality. Tuvok has just plays it as a straight Vulcan. And so he's like very uncomfortable in social circumstances where everyone is having fun definitely extremely me. Um, he's very like rigorously logical and cerebral and intellectual and, you know, awkward, totally me. Um, and so like Tuvok is just the perfect person to read my words. So I was very happy with all of that. Nice, nice. Ryan confirmed, confirmed Vulcan. Vulcan. I'll take that as high praise. Um, did, after working with all these, um, I guess, re rel respectively famous in their field, did they request Norbar keyboards afterward? Uh, well, no, I think he, uh, or did you give Tim Russ one? didn't know enough about keyboards. Okay. So what I, I did give Tim Russ something, but okay. it was something that I actually made for Roddenberry Entertainment. Cause you know, I used to make oh, yeah. these officially licensed mm -hmm. Star Trek props. And one of the, the first thing I made for them was a, for the 50th anniversary of Star Trek. Uh, I made a replica of this pin, which is the symbol of Vulcan culture from the original series. Um, and, uh, this actually, uh, I'm sort of very proud of this thing because it represents an idea which I uh, very much enjoy called, uh, it's called the Idic pin, stands for infinite diversity and infinite combinations, which is the cornerstone of Vulcan philosophy. Um, and uh, the, uh, we gave one to Whoopi Goldberg actually when she came to the convention at, mm -hmm. uh, in Vegas for the 50th anniversary. And then she actually wore it on stage during her stand-up wow. performance uh, the next night and she talked about it for like 15 minutes about how deeply meaningful this thing was to her wow. and like symbolic of yeah. why she wanted to be in Star Trek. Um, so anyway, I had one of these left and I gave it to him and he actually yeah. recognized it and knew what it was because, um, <laughs> you know, he had studied enough about the culture that he was supposed to be a part of that he actually knew something about it, which you can't wow. necessarily say of a lot of the Star Trek actors. Right. Um, so that's cool. Uh, that's, that's to answer nice. your question, Garrett, I do have an IMDB page, but that precedes making this film. Uh, I've made some props that were used in a Star Trek thing uh, and I was so I'm credited in the art department for that thing already <laughs> oh. oh we have I think that's Jared Ornery that's Jared yes yep. hi Jared and Daniel I think he's driving Who's back Who's Daniel Daniel is boyfriend Daniel oh. <laughs> I've told you that oh okay okay uh, all right we can open it up to questions if you're comfortable. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, so if, if you guys had any questions for Norbar or myself, or a question for both of us, uh, if you could tag me, it'll highlight it in chat so it's easier for Ryan to read. <laughs> I have a boy from Brandon. Any nice news to meet you, on the Brandon. Seneca? <laughs> uh, 
So news on the Seneca. Yeah, so the Seneca, for those who don't know, is my, uh, I, I'm working on making a whole kind of new switch platform that is uh, capacitive in nature and therefore similar to Topra and NIS boards, uh, but intentionally sort of designed from the ground up um, for the things that we know the enthusiast community, we the enthusiast community care about. Uh, and I think that, you know, each of those other switch platforms has their own sort of quirky history um, that make them sort of accidentally great in some ways for things that enthusiasts care about. But um, there are a lot of uh, things that I think could be optimized uh, beyond the, w the current form factor of those, uh, the, those switches and sort of the, the platform around them. And so for the longest time, I've, uh, you know, I've been making Topra aftermarket housings, and uh, I enjoy that very much because Topra has always been my favorite uh, switch and sort of uh, just general keyboard platform. But it's somewhat creatively limiting for me. Uh, there are things that I would like to improve uh, about it that I don't have control over because I don't, uh, I don't make the PCB, I don't make the switches, the sliders, and all of that. Um, so my sort of ambitious idea, or increasingly ambitious idea over the past many years has been to move away from making aftermarket housings to actually making keyboards that a person can buy and plug in and use, uh, uh, primarily because it will allow me to control all of the factors and all of the, and I'm not reliant on some other supply chain that I don't have any control over. So that's what I've been working on. Uh, the This is another one of those has been 90% done for 90% of the project <laughs> types of operations. And uh, the thing that has really held me up is the stabilizers. Uh, I really want to fundamentally improve uh, keyboard stabilizers. And particularly, um, I don't like the idea of having to have lubricated stabilizers uh, to have to lubricate stabilizers to get them to perform to some bare minimum standard of acoustic, you know, performance. Um, and so I've been working on solving that problem. Uh, and I, I have solved the problem happily. I'm currently working on filing a patent for my solution. Uh, so I can't necessarily give too much details yet until like next week, <laughs> but um, the, uh, I, th I think I finally cracked this nut as it were, but it has been, been an effort of like, you know, a full-time effort over the course of the past 16 months, just solving this one problem. Cause I didn't want to use off the shelf sta uh, stabilizers and then ship them lubed and then have the lube, sl you know, slowly erode away over time or require people to like, you know, the other thing also is just even like getting them consistent within the board is really hard. Right. And so this whole project originally started out with my wanting to make a cherry MX board and uh, thinking about like, what are ways that we can automate switch lubrication and uh, stabilizer lubrication so that you can get it consistent across the board and between assembly operators and things like that. Um, and I ultimately just decided that that was not the best solution, that there are other ways of, of solving those problems. And so that's what I've been working on lately. Uh, and I think we're, we're getting very close to uh, being able to make the production tooling for these components, but it, it's still, still a few months out. So. Yeah, I got to play with the, uh, the most recent prototype. I, we can't show it, unfortunately, but it looks promising. It's not like every other stabilizer that's just kind of tweaking tolerances here and there. What Norvar is working on is actually a redesign of what we have thought of stabilizers to be. So be yeah. on the lookout. It's a different mechanical solution. Yeah, actually a different mechanism. A lot of research went into it, too. Um, I've been kept in the loop for it, uh, thankfully. I, I, I eventually, <laughs> so, you know, I did like... 12 months of my own research and development on this. And I got, like, I got to the point where I said, I think I fully understood the core problems. Mm -hmm. um, but there was just this tiny, you know, little bit of improvement that I wanted to make that I just couldn't get right. Um, particularly, I was seeing like binding in some circumstances that um, I just couldn't understand how to eliminate. And so I ended up hiring, finding and hiring this a company in Denmark that specializes in like very high-end consumer products. They've done uh, work for Audi and Bang and & Olufsen and Lego, and you know they have a lot of expertise in injection molded components used in high-end luxury products. Um, and they are unbelievably expensive, but <laughs> unbelievably good. Uh, and they really were able, in very short order, to get me, you know, to this new kind of. Uh, solution that is pretty radically different than anything I'd tried in the past. And I'm very excited about that. And I'm uh, totally happy to have paid them the fortune <laughs> that I paid them. But uh, 
it's the first time of my my doing something like that mm -hmm. and um uh, maybe a lesson in the future that sometimes it's good to ask for help when you haven't fully solved a problem and <laughs> someone else can solve it in five minutes all right uh i think someone earlier said so i haven't been watching the chat closely uh i've been trying to uh where was it someone asked what oh, what keyboard do you daily nowadays my daily keyboard uh is the same keyboard I have used since uh, 2009 or something like that. The core, the core of the keyboard, which is a RealForce uh, 87U, uh, where I swapped in the standard 45 gram domes to 30 gram domes for the alpha keys, and then I leave 45s on the the modifiers. Uh, for the longest time, I used that in a uh, Korean uh, aftermarket case um, from a, a uh, company. I think it was called KBD Mod. Um, mm from back in the day, uh, that also made Cherry MX uh, housings, which I loved for a really long time, uh, but then I, I scratched it with my calipers, <laughs> the, the, the black anodizing. And that scratch is in many ways responsible for my getting into custom <laughs> keyboard. Uh, and uh, eventually, you know, of course, I made the, the Norbaforce housing, which uh -huh. is housing for the 87U and that family of keyboards. And so I took a reject anodized housing that I, this is the black it's ironic one, right? now that yeah. I think about it. <laughs> I have a reject, slightly like scuffed, messed up housing, and that's what I use in my keyboard. But because it's mine, it's okay that it's scuffed. Because I could, I know in theory I could always make a, a new perfect one if I needed to. But I, I feel like I didn't want to waste, you know, this factory second housing, and so I decided to use it because I knew I would not care about it, but other people would. So I'd rather send the first quality. Thing. Do you ever swap out? cases just for color for the fun of it no 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 okay. I, I i swap out i do that on tables next to my desk so mm. i'll just put a pretty keyboard there to look at <laughs> but i just have the one because too much work i have this one keyboard that i really like mm -hmm. you know jared has lubed the stabilized keys and I, it's just exactly what i'm used to typing on and so it's easier for me to just leave that there yeah. and if i want to I, there's no i have no shortage of like pretty keyboards around my house <laughs> that's so, true <laughs> um, that is true their room ornamentation as much as anything else <laughs> uh garrett asking when are we going to make the nor bauer together referencing <laughs> his bauer line of keyboards yes <laughs> this was often a source of some confusion to me uh people will sometimes <laughs> email me for customer support on the bauer <laughs> keyboard and he probably gets something in reverse uh, but uh, yeah, we should do some sort of collaboration. I think we've talked about something along those lines. And of course, he uh, now has acquired the tooling for the heavy grail switch right, plate. So yeah. I think he's going to act. We can, you know, you could call that the Norbauer in a way. <laughs> uh, so, you know, he's making uh, his own differently designed housing around mm. the plate. Mm. Um, so that's All a right. collaboration in a way, for sure. Uh, let's see. What other question? Ryan cracked the nut so we can nut when we use stabs without lubing them. <laughs> uh, okay. What are your and Ryan's thoughts on the Flux keyboard? I don't know if Ryan's familiar. I have no idea what it is. I'm sorry. Uh, I can show you real quick. It's a, a Kickstarter that's going on right now. Oh, I do. Yeah, I get Instagram a, uh, ads for this. Yeah, it's kind of a recent trend we might be seeing with at least the more like gaming yeah. market oriented consumers but i mean my take on that, i've as i said i've actually seen this a lot because of i get instagram ads every 15 seconds for it or maybe <laughs> facebook but um you know it's a little gauche for my aesthetic sensibilities i don't like you know monitors are monitors and keyboards are keyboards i don't look at my keyboard when i'm typing as mm -hmm. most people who you know have been using a keyboard for a while do uh it's like conceptually cool it's very like the original concept of the l cars computer interface in star trek which was uh, you know supposed to be a self reconfiguring set of keys on a flat you know surface um so conceptually i like it but i just find it to be a little kind of i don't know ugly <laughs> <laughs> um but it's cool that it exists i'm entirely in favor of that do, um, do you think this would make more sense in like terminal settings um I've thought so. There is actually a project that I've thought about doing that would be fun, which is a like a very retro-looking device that is a keyboard, but then has a monitor right on the keyboard that is specifically designed and has software tailored to a text-based terminal, like a Linux terminal. 
Oh. Um, I thought that would actually be really fun because then you could have, you know, your like if you're doing web development, for example, you could have on your screen the browser, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's set up to auto refresh as you make edits to code. Um, but you could have an actual, you know, terminal window in its own separate, dedicated, you know, sort of uh, in the correct aspect ratio for a terminal, wow. stuff like that. Um, but again, I think here your fingers are actually obscuring what you're typing on. Right. Right. Um, so I don't know. Maybe actually up there on the top is that. Yeah, I think that's a signable area, right? So it's kind of more like a, one of the Apple Macs that has that bar. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, Mac oh, yeah. Same. You can display information. It looks like. Yeah. <clears throat> So, you know, it's, it's cool, not for me. My favorite thing about it is uh, that you can just like pull that thing off and clean it really easily. Well, I think that's supposedly neat. it also switches out the, uh, it ch I think they're using like maglev switches or something or some kind of hall effect. Yeah. So they can change the tactility, I think as well. That makes sense. Yeah. It's, um, a, it's unfortunate, though of course physically necessary that the magnets are somewhat visible, right? Mm -hmm. On each side of the key. Um, I wonder if that comes off better or worse in person than it does in the videos. <laughs> um, you know, Moshiki asking, is your ultimate goal to have your keyboards featured in a Disney film? <laughs> uh, I can't say that that's particularly uh, a goal of mine. I, I'm in favor. Uh, I think Disney probably sells product placements and they're very expensive. <laughs> so I think maybe I'll pass on that. Uh, Shin, who, who we mentioned before helped me produce this film, has mentioned that he wanted to find some way to work one of my keyboards into one of the films that he makes. Oh. Um, so I'm, sure, I'm hard, in favor like. of that because yeah. uh, he probably wouldn't charge me a bunch of money. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's actually like, he's quite a, quite an accomplished uh, director yeah. and writer. Mm -hmm. um, he directed a film that had Anthony Hopkins and Dustin Hoffman in it, I think, or oh, okay. so, some other similarly famous actors. Um, he played a role in uh, Walking Dead. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he was, I think, on the the writing staff of yeah. Walking Dead, um, and so he's a he's a serious player in the world of Hollywood. In addition to being an extraordinary keyboard enthusiast and popular yeah. keyboard Instagrammer. <laughs> well, I mean, he, and he's also he just very. Um, supportive individual yeah he's just like really yeah. friendly honest sincere person which you would uh not necessarily expect of someone who's sort of uh, accomplished in that industry but mm -hmm. he's just a genuinely nice guy yeah <laughs> um okay next question uh for nord what was the inspiration for the first grail oh for norb i'm mm -hmm. guessing Inspiration for the first Grail. Um, that's an, uh, what do you mean by inspiration? I I think the the inspiration for the project really fundamentally was the technical challenge. Uh, I thought it, you know people. I always made these aftermarket housings for Topra keyboards, but the one obvious gap in that um, that I hadn't tackled was the HHKB. In, I don't know if it's actually the most popular, but perhaps like the most, let's say, legendary keyboard in the enthusiast community. Um, and I had not made a housing for it because of all the technical challenges surrounding the plate. You know, you, the the HHKB plate is a single injection molded part that is contiguous with the housing. So you can't, like all of my other boards, remove the plate and place it into a housing. So in order to um, to make an aftermarket housing for it in the way that I do with all of my other things, I actually had to completely reverse engineer and recreate the reverse engineer and modify uh, the original uh, HHKB plate, which was uh, something that I just sort of dismissed for a really long time. But slowly, as I kind of got better at industrial design and manufacturing stuff, I, you know, I, I guess I increased my uh, ambitions or naivete, depending on how you want to look at it. And I decided to give it a go. Um, and it was really that uh, the challenge of doing something that seemed perhaps uh, impossible, but I wanted to see if I could solve it, right? Mm. And so everything kind of flowed from that. And um, the if the question was about the design, the particular form factor, my goal was to try to, um, you know, so personally, I like using keyboards totally flat. I think it's the most ergonomic way to use a keyboard. I used to have lots of wrist tendonitis issues, and I found that that was an enormous uh, improvement for me once I started getting in the habit of holding my, you know, my arms straight while typing. And so uh, normally I tend to make keyboards that at least have that option. But I figured for this particular project, 
that um, I wanted to do something that sort of was as close as possible in form factor to the HHKB itself, which means having an t- inherent typing angle. Um, and uh, so I pl- experimented with lots of design ideas around that concept, but I wanted to keep this sort of like very uh, soft retrofuturist design that I'd used on the Norbiforce, just because I personally aesthetically like mm-hmm. that best. Um, you know, I've, I have these more kind of chamfered industrial sort of keyboards like the Heavy 6 and the Heavy mm-hmm. 9, but this this is like dearest to my heart, this sort of uh, soft edges and then this like uh, tapered thing on the side. Yeah. Um, but the, the problem with that is that it, that's actually easy to do on the Norbiforce because of its flatness. Mm-hmm. Um, with this keyboard, because of the way the sort of compound angles come together, uh, it's actually much harder to mill this shape. Um, and so I always knew that this would have to be done uh, on a five axis CNC machine. That's actually part of why they're much more expensive to make, even though they're smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately I decided that I kind of liked the aesthetics of it enough to be willing to make that compromise of having to greatly complicate the manufacturing process. Um, so that's sort of the history behind why it looks the way it does and why it exists in the first place. Eight. Pebble asking, what kind of modifications do you do to your Tober boards? Uh, very minimal modifications. I uh, I changed the, as I mentioned, I changed the switch weight uh, to 30 grams for the uh, alphanumeric keys because I do prefer that. I feel like I, I, my fingers can sort of glide over the keys faster and I can type uh, more quickly with it and less effortfully. Um, I do prefer uh, lubricated stabilized keys because um, they are a little rattly if you don't. I think they're better than sort of stock Cherry MX ones, but nevertheless, it's a uh, it's one of these things that is as I've gotten to know a lot of people in the keyboard community who care about these things, including you. I think you guys have sensitized <laughs> me to a thing that I never cared about before. Um, but uh, I think I cannot use unlubricated <laughs> um, stabilized keys any longer. Uh, that, those are essentially the only modifications I do. I, in fact, don't even change to MX compatible sliders. I just use the the black on black uh, Topra keycaps. Yeah, mine are extraordinarily worn by this point, <laughs> especially the space bar. It has like a little indentation where my thumb, uh, you know, fingernail mm. rests in it. Yeah, but I kind of like that. I think for like the first two or three years that I knew you, you still were using stock stabilizers and. On loop switches. Yeah, it did never, <laughs> never bothered me. Yeah, <laughs> I remember like we would talk, like hang out in the Conor office, and you would ask questions about like why do you lube this and that, and I was like, you just have to try. It. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks for that. And um, now Ryan needs the lube. <laughs> yeah, and little did I know I'd spend two years <laughs> designing my own stabilizer to yeah. solve this the problem, problem that was previously completely imperceptible to me. Mm-hmm. Um, sorry. Will the stabs be for both Topra and MX? So the technical solution, yes, is compatible with both Topra and MX keyboards, and I probably will um, create some, an MX compatible uh, set of stabilizers that can be used outside of my keyboard. But because my switch is has an unusual design, I need to make a different stabilizer just for this the Seneca and that f- new family of keyboards. Seneca will definitely not be below 1K to answer your question. Um, <laughs> the uh, And so uh, I will probably solve that as a separate problem, <coughs> but the mechanical solution um, should work on Cherry MX boards as well. It probably, it will be difficult, though I, I don't won't say impossible, to make it compatible with existing plate cutouts. So it might require its own special plate cutout. Hmm. Um, I, for Lu Luna Luna, I, I'm pretty sure that's a Norba Force. No, that's not a Norba Force. That is MX switches. Two forty-seven. Uh, right there. Uh, right so there. this was actually a prototype for the MX board that I mentioned before. Back when I was when I wanted to make my own ready-to-use keyboard, I th- I started out with lower ambitions to to make it Cherry MX compatible uh, board, and that's what you see there is one of the original prototypes where it's kind of based on a. Norbiforce shape, but has a Cherry MX, uh, you know, uh, compatible plate and PCB and everything. That that is not the Seneca. Yeah, never <laughs> never quite saw the light of day that one. Uh, it led to the Seneca in a way. Yeah, I, I do remember seeing you bringing this around. I remember. Um, 
Is DSA After School still available? I think the email you sent uh, as this of morning? last night, there were five sets left. Um, if you want one, <laughs> you might go check immediately, <laughs> and you might be able to get one of the last few ones. Uh, and actually, so if they are sold out right now, uh, and you really want one, let me know. I have a few sets that don't have retail boxes in them uh, that we could still sell you. You could just email shop at norbauer.com, and we could probably hook you up if they are sold out. How was your time working at NASA? Uh, it was great. Uh, that was my first job ever was at NASA. When I started when I was probably like 14 or 15 years old. It was a really exciting time in the history of technology, basically kind of the birth of all the sentiments that I talked about in that video. Um, you know, the internet was just like really starting to be a thing that was penetrating into public consciousness. And uh, I was working in, you know, basically it was called network. I was a network engineering intern. Uh, I think I was... Uh, freshman in high school and um, the uh, so I got to learn all about you know uh, what today we would just call IT you know uh, setting up computer networks how uh, how to do wiring closets and Ethernet and uh, all of that type of stuff which is very exciting to a, a young me <laughs> and also you know I was working with uh, people so the facility where I worked is called the uh, Independent Verification and Validation Software Facility for NASA. And their sole, their sole job was this very interesting idea, which is that for a super mission critical software where bugs can cause people to die or you know billions of dollars to be lost, you need to take testing very, very seriously. And mm -hmm. so um, the idea is to have a, a team of engineers who test the software who have no contact whatsoever with the team that built it so that they don't share any common assumptions, right? Oh, okay. um, and so basically they, they deliver the software and requirements documents to the testers. They don't know anything about the code internals and they just try as hard as they can to break it with automated mm. tools and manual testing and everything like that. Um, so it was a very, it was a very interesting concept that I'd never really known anything about before. And I was very interested in software and, you know, as I have been for all of my life. And it's very exciting to get exposure to this like very high level, very professional version of software development. And also to be interacting with people who are working on these really, you know, cool, exciting things to me, like the, you know, the space shuttle. So for example, there's like 10 people who would give the go right before the space shuttle would launch. And one of the guys who did that on a, every one of those conference calls was like, you know, I helped set up his computer for him, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, it was very exciting for a young me. And so I worked there off and on, uh, mostly during summers between school, like from uh, my freshman year of high school until uh, actually I did the same thing the year between college and my first uh, job after college. This so. facility is in California? No, I'm, it's in West Virginia, okay, actually. I, yeah, I haven't heard of that one. Okay. Yeah. I think I also interned at around 15, 14. Yeah. Closer to 15, yeah. <laughs> We're uh, kind of similar. Precocious uh, young <laughs> nerds. Um, what's your take on the classic IBM Model F PC AT layout? Uh, I'm familiar with the... What is AT? I what can is pull that? it for you. Uh, I actually don't remember what the acronym stands for. <laughs> Oh, but this is like, the one like with the, the function row on the left, right? Yeah, uh, it's yeah, like yeah. the classic uh, IBM Model F keyboard. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely used keyboards. When I was in high school, <laughs> unsurprisingly, one of my favorite classes was typing class, um, <laughs> which, which they called, they were very modern. They called it keyboarding. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, we typed, I learned to type, you know, I learned to type fast on exactly this keyboard so i have a very uh nostalgic attachment to it i think uh you know as a contemporary keyboard it's not necessarily my preferred layout <laughs> i'm pretty accustomed to having you know control alternate and windows keys um <clears throat> but uh i mean it's i'm it's uh, obviously a buckling ibm buckling spring i mo was most ac accustomed to the m um, that's what i used as my home keyboard for much of my life so just the overall feeling of that switch is very nostalgic to me, although it honestly, the sound is a little grating to me as, <laughs> as an adult. <laughs> um, and uh, it's, probably, you know, it's a difficult keyboard to use in an office with other people, but I still, uh, you know, I have a strong nostalgic attachment to it. So that, that whole family of keyboards I quite like. Was the question about the layout? Yeah, what you yeah. thought about the layout. Um, I, you see actually in enthusiast keyboards, a decent number of keyboards that have this left, uh, 
left function row mm -hmm. thing. Uh, and I do kind of like it. I, it would take some re brain rewiring for me because I'm quite used to using the, the function row keys. Use them a lot in uh, like code editors and things mm -hmm. like that for uh, debugging and whatnot. Uh, but I'm not opposed. It does. It uh, should help you with reach, which might also be better for ergonomics. Uh, for those new to Topper style switches, what are some essential mods you recommend doing? I think they're good on their own. Oh. Uh, I don't. I don't like really. I don't like lubed Topper switches. They feel almost in, unless they're done with a very very light hand. They always feel a little sluggish to me. Mm -hmm. um, what about stabilizers? Well, yeah, as we discussed, I'm, <laughs> you know, I, I'm in favor of that. Okay. If you're willing to do it, it's a little, it's a little tricky business because it's easy to overdo, mm -hmm. uh, and again, you get this sort of very unpleasant sluggishness if you if you overdo it. But you can always just wipe it off and give it a go again. You can watch <laughs> Nathan's tr uh, training videos. I always link link people to them. Uh, are you happy with how the heavy girl plate turned out? Did you ever consider other materials? So uh, yes, I mean, we, we actually did uh, both ABS and polycarbonate, uh, polycarbonate for its transparency, although I've subsequently learned that there's transparent ABS. Um, but uh, PC and ABS have a very almost identical shrinkage rate, so you can actually use the same tool for both. So we did PC. I, I think it probably does have slightly better sound, or at least it, it gives it different sound. So we wanted to give people the option. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy with how it turned out. I'm actually surprised that it came out as well as it did. Um, you know, it's, it's made by normal manufacturing processes, so occasionally some of them aren't, you know, exactly identical. Sometimes you have to, like, especially that you get, the, I, I talk about this in the assembly video, you get this, like, flashing sometimes where the, the parting line is and you have to sort of sand Fine. it out a little bit, yeah. Um, and sometimes we've, uh, we'll get batches where the, uh, the ejector, ejector pins on the back push a little bit too hard into the plate and will deform things a little bit and you don't really discover that until um, you're actually building it and it's very hard to um, very hard to detect in our inspection but uh, I would say overall I never thought even making this thing would be possible so the fact that uh, so many people like it and uh, so many people purchased it and seem to like it so much has been very gratifying and a little bit surprising to me honestly um, <laughs> um, will your new switches have both tactile and linear options uh, sort of. They, so the, I am of the opinion that 30 gram domes on Topra is actually sort of linear like, um, in, and so you can sort of think of like a standard 45 gram dome as, you know, definitely having a tactile quality to it, but the 30 gram domes are light enough that it's somewhere between a tactile bump and an almost linear switch. Uh, and I definitely will be making 30 gram domes because again, that's my personal preference. But one thing I, so, you know, one of the nice things about having, why I wanted to do this in the first place uh, is to have my own sort of switch platform where I can control these things and experiment with them. Mm -hmm. So I'm starting out with the basics, uh, but if people are interested in supporting this work and end up buying it, um, I will then have, obviously you have poured a lot of money into R&D on all of this right now. <laughs> so I don't really want to make tooling for new exotic dome types, but eventually if I can afford to do so, I would love to uh, make diff experiment with different dome geometries and materials and see what kind of different feelings we can get mm. um, while still maintaining the core um, switch architecture that uh, you know is designed to be have really a really nice fit and extremely minimal wobble mm -hmm. um, so I've been th I've been talking with uh, my engineering colleagues uh, in Denmark about this and we've been thinking about like if there might not be a way to uh, create some type of simulation in software that mm -hmm. allows us to predict the force curve of a dome mm -hmm. um, just from software because you can 3d print uh, things in like a 60 shore a durometer material just like uh, topper domes but the the trouble is that it's a, it doesn't have the same properties as an actually right. you know, injection molded um, rubber dome mm -hmm. and so it like it's the right shape, but it doesn't behave correctly. So the only way to really get a actual force curve right now is to make a metal mold and injection mold a yeah. dome. That's uh, pretty expensive. And it's very, very expensive. So, yeah. so to just like, just for messing around, it's something you can't do casually, mm -hmm. right? Um, which is why I'm hoping there might be some software solution to this problem where we can at least get a sense of like what, 
maybe we could even start with a force curve and have it generate the dome geometry for us. I don't know, but uh, that's that's another you know ninety percent ninety percent of the time project <laughs> for next year, I guess. It would be nice to have more options for domes, um, not so in the not so much in the weight department, but how it feels. Right. Because like you can make domes more snappy, sharper, rounder. Exactly. So yeah. that would be um, cool I do if like you the options. I, I I do find like the BKE options kind of interesting conceptually. I don't yeah. personally love using them necessarily, but I think they're cool. I, I think <laughs> I do BKE, have a couple of keyboards that use them. Like BKE has the sharpness down, mm -hmm. but I will want something that's perhaps even less tactile than OEM Topra. Okay. Don't tactile. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's probably the direction I would also go yeah. uh, just for my aesthetic preferences. Mm -hmm. I think 45 is as snappy as I actually personally care for. <laughs> Um, they bleed said or asks, are you passionate about anything else outside of the keyboard space that you would someday consider using your design and fabrication skills to produce something for? He kind um, of already has done one, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, my, my other great passion in life is Star Trek and particularly the production design of Star Trek. And it's, uh, so, which is to say the design of the sets and the hand props and, um, all of the physical physical environments of the show because they were particularly star trek the next generation had a very specific vision of what the future would look like uh and it's different than most other science fiction uh, depictions which are very uh, in traditional science fiction it's a lot of like uh silver and black and hard edges and a lot of mechanical things uh or sort of like industrial looking elements but in star trek the next generation everything is very soft edged it's very like sort of muted pastel colors natural materials like wood and wool um, and i am very drawn to that vision of what an optimistic future would look like uh, and so i've always just loved all of the props and everything from star trek the next generation in particular so i was very fortunate for a time to have the opportunity to do a lot of the consumer products for Roddenberry Entertainment, which made very sort of high-end replicas of Star Trek props. So uh, that's, uh, in many ways, I consider my greatest life accomplishment was, uh, you know, I made and sold this small run of Captain Picard's computer from Star Trek The Next Generation, which my sort of 15-year-old uh, self is eternally excited about. <laughs> um, and uh, so that would probably be the best example. I can check that off the list. I do quite, uh, you know, I share your enthusiasm for camera equipment and occasionally uh, have frustrations with it and uh, sometimes think about solving those. I I, ha Ooh. I have made like some custom brackets and things so for a Nor a lighting Bauer controls and whatnot. Camera, I'm down. <laughs> well, not not a camera. So that's that is very ambitious. Uh, but even just like you know grip equipment and stuff, I've mm -hmm. designed some custom things that I use around my own studio. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, they're probably things that other people might use also. But I don't wouldn't know how to like reach those people who want to buy it. So I don't know. It's, uh, I have I have keyboard problems. I can't, <laughs> I can't deal with <laughs> cameras just yet. Um, with Seneca allowing for bespoke layouts, what layouts are you interested in pursuing the most? Sure. So I should pr uh, clarify my terminology here. The Seneca is the first keyboard around my new Switch platform. So I'm referring to the like the the switch and the stabilizers and the PCBs as like my switch platform. I guess we could call it like Norbauer switches or something. Um, the Norma and, switch. Yeah, let's not call it that. <laughs> but um, the uh, that's just that's an an infinitely flexible platform around which specific keyboards can be built. The Seneca is a specific keyboard with a specific design, a TKL, that has a shape similar to the Norba Force. Um, but with some important differences. Um, and uh, I definitely will, uh, again, assuming that this doesn't bankrupt me and anyone buys the Seneca, I will move on to other layouts after that, of course. Uh, I would say I, I'm particularly compelled by the um, like the FC-660C layout. I find mm. that to be pretty familiar to me. HHKB is a step beyond what I'm really comfortable using for a daily keyboard, but uh, I'm sure I will eventually give in to the incessant requests for people to have that layout as well. I do find the, like the physical form factor of it probably the like just the makes for the prettiest keyboard. Uh, it's very compact and uh, the I don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's something about that layout that I really like, mm -hmm. just from an aesthetic standpoint. Even if personally it doesn't give me the keys that I'm accustomed to and want, uh, so I'll probably do that. It's a uh, the H the thing with the NH. HKB layout is it requires a little bit more complicated firmware to mm. deal with the layers and things like that. 
but uh, you know it's a solvable problem. Yep. Uh, for the Seneca, do you plan on offering different plate materials or mounting types like current custom MX designs? Um, what do they mean by mounting types? Um, so you mean so like, like a lot of modern uh, MX customs nowadays, they'll offer the user to mount it in different ways. Yeah, so you can uh, a lot of boards nowadays mm -hmm. you can either top mount it or gasket mount it. Mm -hmm. uh, some boards offer like three different mounting systems that you can okay. just choose. So. Well, so my general approach on the Seneca is I'm trying to give you like a curated set of choices, right? Because I've tried lots of different approaches and I pick the one that I think actually is the best. So uh, my approach on the Seneca for, for mounting specifically is um, it's top mounted with a, a cork gasket. Um, and uh, that's, that's it. There are no other <laughs> options unless you want to make your own gasket. And I always be, will be. So... A lot of products like this that are sort of, you know, so in some ways my model for the new stuff I want to do is actually like a cameras in some ways, you mm -hmm. know, um, but there's, uh, their products are not what I would call particularly like modification friendly. Right. Uh, people do it, but it's, it's not like, uh, it's not really an open platform. Mm -hmm. My goal as much as possible is to make things like the, you know, the, the cutout for the gasket available on our website so mm -hmm. that if people want to make their own thing they can and uh it won't be something where the the, vo the warranty is void just because you opened the back of it you know mm -hmm. um we want to because i want to sort of acknowledge that while i want to make this something that's accessible to people who just want to buy the best keyboard you know i want to acknowledge my sort of legacy and roots in the tinkerer keyboard community and make the keyboard friendly to that so people who want to experiment with their own gaskets i want to try to make that you know possible um, there was another question related to mounting types. Oh, plate materials. Yes. Uh, possibly, possibly. So my, uh, I have a kind of, uh, philosophy about capacitive keyboards or Topra keyboards in terms of the plates. Uh, I really like flexible keyboards on, uh, flexible plates on MX keyboards, mm -hmm. but I think that, uh, capacitive keyboards in, in general, Topra specifically, is really uh, meant to have a rigid plate because the flexibility and the dampening comes from the switch itself, right? There's like softness and rubber in the switch. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that's that's sort of where you get that, like the compliance from uh, rather mm -hmm. than from the plate. And so uh, I think all of the Senecas will probably come with brass plates um, because they impart that rigidity and they are definitely acoustically superior. So I've like, so much i've delved so deep into so many of these things i hired an acoustic engineer to give me lots of advice about what sort of choices to make mm -hmm. and there's some unusual property about brass that makes it very different than even other denser metals like stainless steel which is very acoustically absorptive mm -hmm. uh or i don't know is absorptive a word but uh, in any case it's uh it, it tends to absorb rever reverberations in a very satisfying way so uh with lots of experimentation with different plate types i think brass is a good default choice. The only problem is that it's somewhat aesthetically limiting, um, mm -hmm. but I've been able to, f to figure out ways of getting like a brass plate to look like really nice silver color, a really nice mm -hmm. metallic black color. So that it looks just like anodized aluminum um, through, uh, there's actually, so we're, uh, I think the default options will be silver and black plates and also uh, like a white e-coat. Um, the silver and black uses uh, the same process that's used on Limo connectors because those okay. are both uh, silver chrome and black chrome, mm -hmm. which previously I didn't even know was a thing, but uh, it's quite nice. And we've gotten really good cosmetic results. Well, I'm surprised you don't know that this thing. Leica has black chrome and silver. Well, yes. <laughs> it, uh, I mean, before Leica and Limo, uh, okay. I was not aware of that okay, concept. Because, okay. uh, you know, chrome you associate with silver, right? right? right. Uh, I, I mostly knew chrome as this thing that people get on, like, car wheels and mm. whatnot, right? And you think of it as the, it's a very shiny, yeah. right? But um, there are different ways that you can treat it that give it a matte finish and can make it black or silver. Mm -hmm. um, and since I'll be using Limo connectors at the keyboard, um, in silver and black chrome, I thought it made sense to maybe just pair those. Mm -hmm. Okay. How are you feeling? Can you do more questions? Or? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, do you have any plans to produce a more economically priced keyboard, either electrocapacitive or MX? Uh, would that be a matter on economics of scale or else? 
economies of skills to be looked at down the line or is that not a consideration i think i'm a bad person for that type of thing i'm just like somebody <laughs> else would do that much better than i would uh i don't know how to i'm really i'm not very as, as much as i aspire to be and i'm inspired by people who are i'm not particularly good at business um, <laughs> and particularly things like logistics and squeezing out like you know uh, bits of margin from economies of scale or efficiencies i'm just absolutely awful at that um, I can do things that are weird and unusual that other people wouldn't do and that would not otherwise other, otherwise exist, but oftentimes that's just really expensive and that's just what it is. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just, I'm sorry. I'm just bad at it. So probably not. Uh, I certainly would be welcome to, you know, happy to work with people who have experience in that domain um, to help them make something maybe that's sort of based around the technology that, I, that I've been developing. Entirely in favor of that. I'm just, it's not, it's not my thing. Sorry. <laughs> uh, would the Seneca have adjustable actuation point like no. APC on Topper? That is uh, patented Topper technology that's currently in patent. So uh, nobody mm. else can, can do that currently. I see. Uh, will you offer variable weights on the Seneca? Uh, if we're talking about dome weights, then yes. Um, starting with 30 and 45 uh, rough equivalents. Uh, I probably won't actually give numbers. I'll just be like light and medium or something. Um, and then we'll, we'll do something heavier at some point later. But uh, that will require a, a separate mold. So um, oh, at some point later. Chubies, hello. Hello, Chubies. Did you know that the new ride at Disneyland, Mickey's Runaway Railway, mm -hmm. has a character called Chuby? That is kind of like oh, you did not tell a, me at it's, it's a cute little bird. I think oh. I didn't learn it until Jared mentioned it to me. But oh, is it the little bird at the end? That's right. Oh, yeah, okay. That's chuby, and they sell like stuffed chubies now. Oh. Why did you choose wool dampeners over other materials? Um, just simply by experimenting and finding it to be have the best results. Uh, I was originally going to use. Um, what's that thing that it, the sort of squishy stuff that everyone uses? Uh, Pour on. No, not pour on. Uh, Cork? It's specifically like an acoustic dampening material. Oh, sorbethane. Yes, called sorbethane. Yeah. And I even went so far as to get uh, a mold, test mold made for it uh, that specifically fat, uh, fit inside the heavy grail. But uh, when I tried it out alongside a wool dampener, the wool dampener just worked much better. Mm. Um, I, you know, Wool is used a lot in acoustic treatment of like sound booths and things like that. So that's where I got the idea from. And I also just... I tend to be drawn towards natural materials anyway. That's why I'm using a cork gasket on the Seneca. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just I aesthetically liked it better and it seemed to perform better. So, yeah, uh, I've been, I have wool mats everywhere now. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, this is an interesting question. Would you offer retrofit kits for existing Norbar keyboards so you can utilize your new Switch platform? Never thought of well, that. That's an actually. interesting concept. Yeah. Uh, the, I don't think there would be anything technically to preclude that. Oh, okay. So that is... You're the first person to give me that idea. Let me... Yeah, I also it. have never <laughs> asked around about that. That's very interesting. That would be also another way of making it more affordable. Right? That's true. Um, if you don't... If you can't afford the Seneca, but right. you like the Norbar aesthetic. Yeah. Because um, the, the Seneca is like, in addition to the Switch platform, is internally somewhat complicated um, and expensive to manufacture. So there are things that you could kind of like... If you're willing to compromise on those and retrofit it into an existing housing, I don't see why that wouldn't be possible. Yeah. Um, okay. What well, mic are you using? This is the Shure SM7B. This is the Sennheiser, I think, 441? I forget the model number for this. Uh, did you say cork? Are there any concerns for degrading over time? Um, so that's, uh, that is a concern that I've heard. Um, I've spoken to the, uh, when I say I've heard it, I've heard it from other people who have considered using cork in the keyboard community for gaskets. Um, but I've spoken to the company that is making these gaskets. They're here in the U S and they do all of my die cutting stuff. So like all of our bump ons and things like that. And they have a, you know, uh, decades of experience working in this type of stuff. And they got started making gaskets in particular for, you know, like industrial applications. Uh, and they claim that the cork that they use is extraordinarily resilient over time because of the additives and uh, rubbers and things that are incorporated into it and mm -hmm. that it shouldn't be an issue. Now, I haven't uh, yet tested it in extremely humid environments or, uh, you know, very exotic situations. Uh, but 
my feeling is maybe you'll be having other problems first <laughs> if you're in one of those like very wet environments or something. Um, but you know, we'll find out. And if for some reason they all suck or something, we'll just send everyone uh, new gaskets. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> you know, part of my sort of general view of this this uh, this business in general, right, is uh, I want to be in a position to ensure that people have a good experience. And that's part of why I don't want to dabble too much in this, like, uh, t you know, low margin cost competition domain is because, like, I want to be able to be like, oh, the, your gasket broke down after two years. Just send it to us. We'll swap it out for you, right? Mm -hmm. And not, you know, fantastically lose money doing that. And um, the, this is why, you know, I think we talked about this in that interview you did with me and maybe on other occasions that like why I think the, even though I have some trepidation about the concept of luxury as a like social thing, um, I think that it is an interesting model for a certain type of low volume, high artistry manufacturing that ensures that people have a really good experience because it's connected to an object that is has, is like high emotional investment for them. I just personally find working in that sort of realm very compelling and interesting. It's something I want to do. And uh, the way to do that is you just need to figure out how to charge enough <laughs> and provide enough value <laughs> that you can actually deliver people a good experience without going out of business, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so uh, I'm always trying to move in that direction when I can of being in a position financially to, to essentially guarantee people a good experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is just by way of answering that other question of why maybe I'm probably not running to make a $200 keyboard. Uh, Chubies asks, have you had any thoughts about implementing compliant mechanisms into keyboard design? <laughs> uh, yes, I've had a lot of thoughts about that. Well, so the Topra keyboards and capacity keyboards in general are in fact compliant mechanism devices. The uh, so uh, are you familiar with the concept? Have we talked about compliant mechanisms before? I feel like you probably have. Yeah, me. it's this uh, it's this idea that is all the rage right now um, in mechanical engineering circles. Partly because of the increasing popularity of three D printing makes it easier to tinker with compliant mechanisms. But they're systems that take a mechanical design concept and tr that has lots of individual parts and interfaces between the parts and removes those interfaces and instead replaces them with flexible components. So you can uh, make a sort of intricate mechanical design from a single part. If you just like, uh, you can do it with injection molding or water jet cutting out of a single piece of metal. Okay. Um, and so you can create, you know, if you were uh, like a, a classic example of this is a living hinge on a, uh, like a, bottle of moisturizer or a tube of moisturizer where you like you open it and then it flexes right mm -hmm. that technically is a compliant mechanism because it takes something that would normally be a rigid mechanical mm. uh, device like the hinge on a door mm -hmm. and turns it into something flexible okay. that performs the same mechanical function okay. <clears throat> but it can be injection molded out of a single part and in fact the domes on topper keyboards are compliant, compliant mechanisms okay. right um, you're, you're using that the inherent flexibility of the material to get a mechanical property that you want mm -hmm. and that might not even be achievable through purely mechanical means or certainly not in that very con confined space um, I did look at uh, you know lots of different compliant approaches for use in the switch and the stabilizers uh, and I <laughs> there were downsides to especially the like injection molded approaches um, but I, I just I find compliant mechanisms very interesting, and I'm always looking for any kind of way to incorporate them into my designs. Any thoughts on new coding or finishing options for this project? Oh yes, we've been exploring those constantly um, <laughs> for the past couple of years. While I'm working on the switches, I'm also like, you know, uh, working these other aspects of the project in parallel. And one of them is uh, finishing options. I really am increasingly enamored of eCoat because it's you know. I've used powder over the years uh, frequently because it gives, uh, you know, compared to anodizing, it gives an opaque finish. And so there are colors that are achievable with uh, powder coating that you just couldn't do with anodizing or even uh, paint, especially if you want the textures that we sometimes do. Um, the problem with powder coating, though, is that especially, uh, at least at the shops I've been able to find here in the United States, they tend to not use uh, 
they tend to not coat it in a booth where they are filtering both the air going in and out of the room. Mm -hmm. And so there's, uh, in addition to the normal problems of not particularly, not always a uniform finish, you get occasionally get little surface particulates, mm -hmm. and uh, those drive me crazy. And uh, people reasonably expect from us a very high quality surface finish, and so we have very high reject rates on powder coated parts. Sometimes it's been as much as fifty percent, uh, I, I mean sometimes more actually. Uh, in in the worst cases, this this finish here of the uh, retro refrigerator is has always been by far simultaneously the most popular finish we've ever offered and the highest reject rate, hardest to apply finish. Um, <laughs> it's my favorite though. <laughs> yeah, it's many people's favorite. It's actually a favorite of mine. I love it. Uh, it's very like it's very on brand for me because it's uh, kind of retro design, but it's also on this futurist object and many reasons why I love it. But it's just really hard to get perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have been finding uh, powder coating vendors that can do higher quality surface finishes in like a very clean room application, right? Um, and we're going to try revisiting this again soon. Oh, um, but like the retro refrigerator. Specifically, okay. yeah, the sort of glossy That's one. That's great to hear. Um, and, but uh, one thing that has proved much more reliable is E-coat, because E-coat is actually applied in a tank underwater. And it is a paint finish, but it's it's you know it's it's an electroplating in a way like uh, you know uh, gold plating metal or something where the mm -hmm. the paint is attracted to the part in the water through uh, an electrochemical deposition process, and as a result of the uh, like somehow the paint magically getting distributed within this liquid, it it just naturally applies in a very uniform way, mm -hmm. in a way that it would be harder to do if it was just a human manually spraying it. And so e-coat finishes, particularly the satin ones, just seem to always come out perfect, really good. Mm. Um, and so I've been very encouraged by that. But the only problem with e-coat is it's, uh, it's, they really don't want to mix custom colors for you because it has to be done in a huge batch. And unless you have thousands and thousands of parts, it's just it's very wasteful. And mm. uh, the, the time required to set it up um, just doesn't make sense for 100 keyboards or 200 keyboards. Um, and so you're you're stuck with a pretty limited palette of colors. Mm -hmm. uh, they have a so far I found a, a very nice white. There's lots of good white, you know, uh, e coat that you can get. Uh, there's a nice pink, which is actually almost identical to the Sunset Boulevard finish I've offered, uh, like on the Heavy Grill. Uh, but this it's like four or five colors, and mm. w this is not one of them. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, they have something vaguely similar. It's kind of a like jade green, uh -huh. pale jade green, but it's it's not exactly what I want. This is more of a, almost like a Tiffany blue. It's somewhere in between blue and green. And it's, it's a very specific hue that, um, I even tried to get a, pus, a custom powder coat mix of this and have not been successful. Um, Can you do glossy e-coats? I don't know if I've seen a keyboard with a glossy e-coating. They've all been satin. I, th I think you're right. I think I've only ever seen this sort of medium gloss mm -hmm. satiny look. It, it probably has to do with the way that it's actually deposited on the material. Okay. But uh, someone perhaps can correct us. Uh, E-coat is a slightly new process to me. Because, like, I mean, I don't think powder coating is necessarily my favorite in terms of, like, how it feels. Mm -hmm. But the way it looks, just the way that, like, the lighting shines and sheens, just looks a little different from all For the sure. other coatings, which I, I do I particularly like, like this one, too, because, of the, like, the shininess really exaggerates the geometry, right? Yeah. So you can really see, if this were totally matte white, for example, mm -hmm. the, the the pretty subtle contours, particularly here on the, like, the side of the keyboard, right? The, the keyboard does flare a little bit, but it's not as obvious unless you have those specular highlights, you know, mm -hmm. making it obvious. Um, so, and especially yeah. makes sense for this color. Yeah. With the, the retro theming going on. Okay, I think we're almost done with questions. Um, Brian, you got any retro colors you can recommend? That retro refrigerator heavy grill got me thinking of buying one and painting it. Oh, so, let's see. I'm guessing yeah, he I'm means other sure. retro colors. Retro colors. Well, so the two colors that I kind of associate with retro things are things that I would associate with mid-century modernism. And those two colors are this color, which is sometimes referred to as sea foam in general parlance. Uh, I call it retro refrigerator because refrigerators were often coated in it uh, in the 1950s. Um, but another 
uh, commonly paired color with it is what I also refer to as Sunset Boulevard, but other people sometimes call like seashell blue or something like that. It's mm. Like the inside of a conch shell is, okay. uh, you know, that. Um, so those to me are the quintessential like 1950s colors because they're the ones you would see in, you know, kitchens and home things of that era. There's a, there's a really excellent keto bakery in Los Angeles or uh, Las Vegas <laughs> that I love that is entirely decorated in these two colors and other oh. like retro 1950s. Like they have like an old record player and okay. lots of vintage stuff and I, I really like it as, as, as if someone made a store just for me because <laughs> I, I also observe a keto diet I have really good keto cinnamon rolls <laughs> and excellent colors it's very up my alley uh, are there any interesting books you can recommend oh my god we could talk for hours and hours about that my uh i hate reading so i'm not i can't answer this question <laughs> I, love that just, I hate reading don't tell your parents i'm sure they're very disappointed oh they me. know i mean i'm a math i majored in math so <laughs> Um, don't you, didn't you learn math from books? I mean, yes, but reading, okay, reading like theorems is different from like reading a book, I would say. <laughs> uh, I read all the time. I love reading. I, it's like my first thing I do when I wake up in the morning and it's, if I don't start my, for, you know, occasionally I'm tempted to run to my computer, answer emails if there's something urgent or base camp or whatever. Um, and I, I always regret it if I don't start my day with half an hour, an hour of reading. Uh, you start every day by reading a book. Mm -hmm. Wow. Not a whole book, but a part of it. Uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really an essential part of my, root, at least weekday routine. So let's see. Uh, the I'm, I'm reading a book right now called The Sovereign Individual, uh, which is kind of interesting. I think crypto nerds really like it. Um, and it's an uh, interesting sort of history of... Uh, it was written around the year 2000, I think. And it was about how... you know. So this is sort of uh, related to my interest in the history of techno-optimism. Uh, that I mentioned in the film. And uh, it's, it was a book about um, how increasingly the internet, uh, by connecting individuals without the necessary intermediation of states or large organizations, will tend to um, increase the importance and freedom of individuals. Uh, and, they're, and that they're speculating that this would decrease the significance of the nation state. I'm not sure that this has necessarily been borne out by actual historical events that have transpired since then, but it's an interesting set of ideas. And I like the, uh, I just like the way the authors think. It's kind of a sort of contrarian analysis of history. Uh, so I found it interesting. Book before that that I read was, um, it's called Where's My Flying Car? Also related to this idea. Um, it's by Stripe Press, you know, Stripe, the payment processing company. Oh, I did not know they published books. <laughs> yeah, so uh, they actually... I knew someone who was the editor of their magazine, uh, which was a very interesting There's magazine. There's a Stripe magazine? There's a Stripe magazine. Uh, it, has a, it has a specific name. I don't remember the name. Okay. Um, but uh, obviously the people who run Stripes are cool people who are into interesting ideas. Uh -huh. And so they fund this these like little huh. you know publishing projects. Yeah. But Stripe Press makes um, really interesting books. It's like as if you made a, a publication house just for me. <laughs> just wow. like all about you know, the history of technology and future optimism. And uh, they publish these like uh, old books from the 50s and 60s, or actually earlier than that, uh, about uh, you know speculation by technologists about the ways in which compu personal computing will change, you know, life in the future. Uh, and they also uh, publish contemporary books like this one that I mentioned about. I think it's called "Where's My Flying Car." Um, uh, about uh, there's this idea that. There has been an enormous stagnation in technology, particularly in the United States since around the 1970s, in every domain other than bits, right? So, uh, it, you know, separating the world of bits and atoms. Uh, and in um, the realm of atoms, we expected things like flying cars to be commonplace by the year 2023, and they're very, very far from that. And so the book alternates chapter by chapter from very deep, nerdy technical discussions of why flying cars are actually entirely possible and have been since the 1930s and 40s. Uh, those chapters I found less compelling because I really don't care about aviation very much. Um, but the alternating chapters are about like why the, they never became a thing, right? Um, and it's, it's about the history of technology and culture and uh, you know economic stagnation in the United States and all of the surrounding theses are, uh, about that uh, by economists and so forth. And um, I found that to be a really interesting book. Uh, mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite ones I've read 
recently. When people ever ask me for book recommendations in general, though, I highly recommend Nassim Taleb. Everything he's ever written, I've read like five times. He's my favorite thinker. He changed my thinking about almost everything, especially since I came from this sort of academic background. Uh, and he challenges a lot of the sort of thinking and worldview of, you know, what I was trained to, to understand um, in academia. And my favorite type of book is always the one that changes my mind about something, you know, forces mm -hmm. me to re-examine some assumption that I have. And uh, I've only had a few such experiences in my life, but it is always the most exciting thing. It, I think I'm, I have whatever is the opposite of cognitive dissonance. I think I get excited when some cherished belief of mine gets ripped out of my hands, right? <laughs> you enjoy that. And I've had that a few times, yeah. <laughs> okay. So like, uh, I read this other book called Straw Dogs, um, which challenged the idea of progress, right? So again, growing up on Star Trek, I, I really used to believe in this idea of like inevitable monotonic human progress. Humans mm -hmm. just, society just gets better, technology gets better, and as a result, uh, humans become better. Um, and Straw Dogs just pointed out to me that that doesn't make any sense and it doesn't agree with history and is mm. extremely implausible, wishful thinking based religion. Um, and I was really sad about it. It like <laughs> totally like sent me into a year of despair. But I, I loved having this idea of mine, this cherished thing completely ripped out of my hands because it, I feel like a conclusion is more likely to be true if you desperately don't want it to be true, but you can't deny that it's probably true, <laughs> right? Mm. Um, and so I'm like, I'm very on guard against wishful thinking in myself and I love it when I have my own wishful thinking challenged and so that's always my favorite kind of book and uh, Nassim Taleb is, is great for those types of things mm -hmm. he kind of really challenged a lot of my beliefs in certain types of scientific rationalism excessive scientific rationalism or hyper rationalism as he calls it uh, so uh, I highly 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 recommend Nassim Taleb and I could go on and on and on about books that I love but I'll shut up now <laughs> um Someone says, consider Cerakote. Cerakote is uh, definitely a good finish. I like it. it the actual ap appearance of many Cerakote finishes is similar to Ecote. Um, the only problem I've had, and I've experimented with it with shops here in the US, is they, all, they have the same issue. Shops that do Cerakote tend to be the same shops that do powder coat. They tend to be s smaller mom and pop operations, and they, they have paint booths, but they don't filter the air on the intake. So it is very common to get little particulates on the surface. You know, Cerakote is a spray finish, which is then baked, but otherwise it's the same as powder coating. Uh, and I've just never been able to get consistently satisfactory results with it, at least for applicators here. Uh, I think they're use, used to doing smaller objects that don't have flat surfaces, like mm -hmm. uh, firearms is a very common application for Cerakote here right. in the US. Um, but that that type of application is actually much more forgiving. You wouldn't notice a particulate that's true. Uh, on it in the way that you would on like the big forehead on an Orbiforce. That's just like the hardest thing to uh, to coat in any way because the slightest if you if you move a, a big flat surface under the light, the slightest deviation becomes very obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, and the skills of powder and Cerakote applicators are often not challenged in this way. And so they'll always be like, yes, absolutely, we can do that. We do this kind of stuff all the time. Super high cosmetic requirements, and then always I do it, and then it's no good. Oh, okay. I just came up with a question for you. Sure. With how much trouble and money you have spent on like finding the right powder coat, coater, whatever finish you're looking for, looking back, do you think it would have made more sense to maybe attempt to solve that yourself, like hiring investing in a facility to do powder coating in-house to your standard maybe okay. maybe uh you know this is uh it's another thing i was reading about recently this thing in economics known as the agency problem which is that it's really hard you know when you it's really hard to hire someone to do something that represents your interests right. they necessarily have their own competing interests and they're going to try to you know find some overlap between those and so part of the issue is an agency problem uh the, it is in the interest of the powder coater to kind of like slip in to the products they deliver me some that are maybe a little bit below what we agreed was the standard and just see if I accept them, right? Mm. Um, because uh, it costs them money to strip them and refinish the parts and there's some risk involved because they can sometimes damage the parts in which case then they will we'll have to like dispute about whether they should compensate me for the damage and um, so almost invariably like the first batch is great 
Uh, then there's this, you know, phenomenon known particularly in international sourcing circles as quality fade, where they'll just slowly uh, slip in some and just see see if they say anything, right? Um, whether this is even at a conscious level or not, I don't know. But uh -huh. the doing things in house gets around that problem, right? Um, although, you know, you also have the same problem as an employer with your own employees, right? Um, and uh, but at least the interests are somewhat aligned because you, in theory, the, the people who are working with you, who you, know, you could even like hire someone who's been a professional powder coater and you know, they have some greater investment in your business rather than just a mm -hmm. client that they can tell to go away. Um, so it does sort of solve that problem, but I think I w wouldn't, a lot of the powder coaters that I worked with are genuinely like really trying, <laughs> right? Um, and I. I just think that it's to do it very well requires extremely high-end expensive equipment mm -hmm. and thus really high volumes to justify the mm -hmm. acquisition of the equipment to build a true clean room right mm -hmm. um, is extremely expensive and uh, I'm never gonna have the volumes necessary to justify that right so I've thought about you know buying CNC equipment for the same reason and it's just like you have to be especially you know the the expensive thing about a CNC machine is not the machine it's hiring a competent operator to program it and run it right mm -hmm. and in order to justify that great expense you have to really just be constantly running that machine turning uh turning parts out and uh it makes so much more economic sense to go to a shop that has uh you know someone who has 30 years of experience doing this and is turning out parts all day so you're essentially just renting a slice of the machine time and his mm -hmm. expertise um and so I, again, it's just, it's one of the cha great challenges of keyboard work is it's inherently very low volume. So you have to figure out how simultaneously how to meet unbelievably high expectations of right. community members um, who are, you know, who are all trained to have cosmetic expectations from companies like Apple that are working at volumes of, you know, millions of parts. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to try to get s comparable quality at some sort of conceivably feasible price with a hundred parts, but the, the, the scale is fantastically different and the types of resources that are available to you are fantastically different. Right. Uh, so my solution to this has been uh, to maintain high, extremely high cosmetic standards and just to lose huge amounts of money <laughs> by, you know, uh, by not sending the things that aren't as, you know, up to my standard. Okay. Um, ideally, I would like to fix that problem, but, you know, one thing at a time. I got okay. stabilizers to make. You know. Got it. Uh, have you ever talked to the space holding folks space holding i don't even know uh, space is. previously space cables uh yes I know. yeah because they are now official star coding whatever what i okay. don't know if there's something like that for powder coating cool yeah i mean i think again it would be do, are they using it on their own parts like the fittings so, so yeah yeah so uh again it, this it may be an issue of their never having experienced trying to coat a big Keyboard. flat part and they might discover that it's more challenging but um I'm look anybody who can give me good finishes I, I want to talk to and would definitely be down for but my you know so I, I went to a powder coater in the Bay Area mm -hmm. and I sat them down and I said okay no really I've had this conversation 20 times with 20 different powder coaters <laughs> these really have to be perfect uh -huh. you can charge me whatever you want <laughs> literally whatever you want just let me know and I'll figure out how to make it work uh -huh. um, like absolutely this is our specialty right we do this all the time we work with NASA we work with Tesla we do all these things no problem what class A finishes is the you know blah 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 I wrote up of like 30 page document with pictures of like this is not okay this is not okay all of the problems I've ever had in the past I have a picture of like no problem we got the docs and everything they uh, did work for and and the agreement was you charge me whatever you want but if you send me something that is a reject i'll send it back and you're going to refinish it for free mm -hmm. right um and after a year of working with us they fired us they're like we can't sorry we can't hold this standard it's just too much <laughs> uh, and that's like 100 percent of my experiences end up that way i see and slowly they just they stop answering my emails they're like <laughs> yeah i appreciated that at least they were honest with me usually mm -hmm. it's just like a slow ghosting mm -hmm. but they were just like no we're sending all your stuff back we can't work for you anymore sorry it's <laughs> <laughs> too much we can't no such is my life <laughs> um another question from tubies what do you think will be an upcoming weird wild wacky keyboard innovation www 
wacky keyboard innovation. I like the idea of wacky. Um, I have some little innovations, modest innovations in my keyboard. One of the things that I, uh, this is my way of saying I have no idea. Uh, the uh, In my keyboard, I really wanted to get rid of visible fasteners on the outside. Uh, okay. And so I sort of designed this complex internal gantry system that like um, some key cult boards allows you to fasten the plate from the mm -hmm. front. Uh, but I still wanted to use a rear cover plate um, because of, I wanted to have that be steel to sort of weight down the back and also give the acoustic advantages of it. Um, and that was that was a bit of a project and I've never seen anyone exactly solve it in the way that I have. Um, oh. Keyboard innovations. Yeah, I don't know. I, I When they happen, I probably won't even find out about them until you guys tell me. So. <laughs> I mean, we're kind of seeing a fad of uh, screens with LEDs yeah. underneath the entire typing area. A wacky innovation? Not too sure. <laughs> I did like that wacky keyboard that had the like LED array on the back. Oh, uh, sort uh -huh. of like outrun keyboard. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, the cyberboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cyber, yes, cyber deck <clears throat> maybe. I love that thing. Okay. Uh, if Norbar reads every morning, when does he wake up and when does he set out for whatever has been planned for the day? This is like those uh, YouTube videos about morning routines yeah, of A day in the life people. of Norbar. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's highly variable. I, I, my ideal time for waking up is 8.30, but that rarely, rarely ever happens. I usually wake up at 9.30. Mm -hmm. uh, I have horrible problems falling asleep because I cannot shut off my brain. I think about stabilizers all night long and things like this. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I go to bed at midnight and I maybe don't drift off until 2 a.m., something like that usually. Highly effortful experience. <laughs> uh, so then I wake up around, you know, 9, 9.30. Uh, I try to read first, if possible, with one to two cups of coffee. Um, and then I have been using this program that I really like called Sun Sama, which is for like time blocking Sun -sama. your day. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, I found that to be, I used to be like a hardcore GTD person uh, who was really all about uh, keeping lots of con context based lists and hundreds and hundreds of to do's and everything. And I just, uh, I found that it mostly just stressed me out. Mm. And so instead, I've moved to this software that just encourages you to plan out your specific day and figure out the thing that actually like really is the highest leverage, most important thing for you to do that day and just block out specific ranges of time where you're only working on that thing. And you just mm. close your email, you close everything else, and you just do that thing. Um, and I've been uh, using that for a couple of months, and it's been really quite transformative in my sort of ability to focus and uh, sort of get useful time out of my day. How does it um, force you to stick to that? It doesn't force you. Oh, it okay. just is like a little There's nudge. Reminders? Yeah. Okay. There's something about this, the structure of having planned out the day that just makes you realize that there is finite time. Mm. My, my sort of default assumption previously is just like, uh, you, you kind of, you feel like there's infinite time in the day and then you look up and it's nighttime and then you get sad because you didn't <laughs> do what you wanted. You know? um, and there's something about just rem like actually having to write out, just imagine, okay, this is gonna take three hours, it's gonna take two hours. Oh, shit, I guess I can only do those two things today. <laughs> and it makes you realize, oh, I should probably actually do them because yeah. there's finite time. And mm. somehow that's enough. I don't know. It really, mm. it, it triggers me to actually <laughs> focus. Do you do a lot of like physical writing? Cause a lot of like, there's a lot of options for like analog schedule keeping. Yeah, nowadays. I'm a, this is a fraught question for me right now. I, I'm a huge note taker. I've been a avid note taker since uh, the, like the very first version of OneNote. Okay. And uh, <laughs> I have, thousands and thousands of notes uh -huh. so for like just my notes on photoshop are you know hundreds of pages mm -hmm. right because i whenever i learn something I, I take very rigorous notes about it and then i want to keep it forever in case i want to refer to it in the future and uh but the, the problem is that my notes have outlived my note taking software mm -hmm. and uh one note has slowly become garbage over time um Microsoft has not taken support for it very seriously um there was a time when just like search basically didn't work um they tried to move it to like the, this period of Metro apps. You use Windows, right? So you mm -hmm. remember they were like, there was a brief period when Windows was like, Windows was like, we're going to stop using Windows. We're going to have Metro apps. And oh, it's yeah. going to be like fake mobile. <laughs> for, it lasted for like 15 minutes. But they rewrote OneNote to force uh, you to use this other thing. 
and the, the, the Metro app was extremely limited in what it could do. Uh -huh. And then they just abandoned the normal desktop app. Uh -huh. So it looks like something straight out of 1999. <laughs> um, and uh, it's just, you know, it's pretty awful. So uh, I moved away from that to Notion. I hired a developer to use the OneNote API to translate my, all of my OneNote notes into Notion. Mm. So I, a couple of years ago, I moved to Notion. Increasingly, I'm becoming uncomfortable with Notion, however, because it's a cloud-based service. Um, mm -hmm. And they like there's originally they were just like we we never look at your notes. We have to have your permission. All of this, you know, it was very had a very rigorous privacy policy. And I, I like the app a lot. Its editor is really good, but um, slowly they're like editing their uh, terms of service, and they like they they put something in there recently that really kind of creeped me out. They're like, if you use our service to store misinformation, okay. we, we reserve the right to like delete all your data with no notice, <laughs> you know, Whoa. essentially. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, so they, it's like a content policy or something uh -huh. like that. And I, it's not clear whether that means things officially published, but it does say like store, right? Oh. And it's like dangerous, harmful, mis that could mean absolutely anything. Uh -huh. And something about that just kind of creeps me out. Like, I don't mm. think I would ever be subject to that. I'm like people my notes about what screws I use on my keyboard is not obviously controversial information, but, uh, or, but nevertheless, there's something about it. Just like it made me realize when I saw someone post about this, it made me realize how like this extremely essential to my functioning thing could just be flipped off in a second by, a, you know, a company's arbitrary whims because all of the data just lives in the cloud. Right. Um, so now I'm like, Oh shit, I guess I have to move to something else. <laughs> so, uh, I've been looking at, um, solutions that have like a zero knowledge encryption solution so that uh, no one can actually see or read your notes and they're secure and they're backed up locally right and so i'm uh reluctantly slowly switching to obsidian which Ooh, is very like, i'm on rome research okay yeah, yeah so it's conceptually similar although yeah. rome has the downside of notion which is it's entirely lives in the cloud right no you can have local oh really you okay. can have local yeah yeah so uh realize that yep. well great another one to add to my list of things plan, to yeah. <laughs> uh, investigate in uh invest in but the uh <clears throat> obsidian is kind of plausible to me and so i've been playing around with that recently how did i even get to talking about this <laughs> We're talking about, uh, oh because uh, i asked you oh you yeah yeah, yeah paper yeah so <laughs> i don't you know i like keyboards i like typing so i do everything okay. I, I like i i can type much faster than i can write by hand same uh, and so <laughs> i'm like to keep up with my thoughts, I uh, prefer to type. And so I just mm. keep everything in notes, 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 notes about everything. Got and uh, that's uh, it just, I was triggered by that discussion because <laughs> I'm currently in this process of switching to Obsidian, which is like, it's very, very nerdy. You know, it's just markdown files on disk, yeah. uh, and which is part of the appeal. That's, has that's, like that's certain, exactly why I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's a conceptual, nice conceptual purity to it. But as a result, certain things are very messy and you kind of have to really think about it more as like, VS code or mm -hmm. something like that. And you kind of, uh, I've, I spent basically all day for the past several days, just learning how to customize the software uh -huh. to do the most basic stuff. <laughs> but at this point now I'm actually pretty happy with it. Okay. I, I like, I hired, uh, uh, a CSS person to make my own custom theme for nice. it. And like, we're I doing custom JavaScript. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you can kind of make it okay, but mm -hmm. I wish I didn't, it's like I tried out, I have this list in Notion of the like 20 different no. note taking apps that I tried and all the pros and cons of them. And ultimately this is, I think the decision that I've landed on, but um, then I'm going to have to translate all of my Notion stuff back to, into Obsidian. <laughs> okay. Just uh... see, uh, so hello lens of Lucas. Um, have you ever seen his pictures Where's... on Instagram? He has the most. Uh, yes, I've seen some of really, them. Really, yes. really good eye. Where is this question? Uh, oh, he just said, "Hey." Yeah. Hello. Amazing pictures. Uh, okay, looks like we are. I think about caught up. Yeah. Notion that something that made me switch off of it completely. I think it was something weird with copy paste. So I switched to Obsidian. Yeah, I think the I think the reason why I went with Rome Research over Obsidian uh, was mostly for the aesthetics and then just the the community around that's like developing and stuff for it. Aesthetics are a huge, huge uh, downside of, of Obsidian. Obsidian right. yeah. but, I mean, it's free though. So 
uh, uh, yeah, I guess it is free. I mean, I'm using the sync service, um, oh, okay. which is, you know, not cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how they, that's their business model. Yeah. But uh, as I said, you can, the, the great thing about Obsidian is how great and bad thing about it is how extremely customizable it is, right? Mm -hmm. So the default out of the box experience is kind of okay-ish, yeah. um, but the, uh, it is just under the covers web tech, right? Mm. So you can customize it almost infinitely. Uh, so in some ways that's better, but I, uh, I should play with Rome. Will you guys both be at the next Novel Keys meetup? I think I am. I don't know if Ryan plans to attend. I have complicated feelings about going to West Virginia. So you have to understand I'm from West Virginia. <laughs> um, and sometimes going back makes me a little, I don't know, it gives me gives me feels <laughs> <laughs> but so you know uh mike just came out uh mike and wendell and morgan from novel keys all came out and we went to disneyland mm -hmm. which i find to be a much preferable experience <laughs> i uh I, I feel like we haven't had a big la meetup we have not um i it's, if someone doesn't do it i may have to organize it but i really don't want to someone <laughs> please do it um because i i I remember what was it 2019 that meet up at the like brew very, pub or whatever. I really liked that. It was yeah. it was very large and that it was, was very kind of like meetup. very chill experience. And it was actually in LA, so right. you know there, there were Orange County meetups, but people don't are not going to really fly from around the country to then drive to Orange County an hour or whatever. Um, I think we should have something in LA um, so people can fly Life in for it. Is kind of trying to fill that role right now. Sure, I'm in favor. This year they're hosting it in Pasadena. Okay, yeah, Pasadena is uh, so, uh, excellent. I love Pasadena, actually. Yeah. Um, what unwatched movie are you most excited to watch? Um, unwatched. Indiana Jones 5, or whatever, yeah. Oh, I don't. I haven't been keeping up with movies. I know John Wick 4 just came out. What is it? John Wick. Oh, okay. 4. Yeah. I, um... I always loved Indiana Jones as a kid, and they're making mm. a new movie. I'm sure it'll be absolutely awful, uh, but it's uh, Spielberg, uh, right? Yeah, that's and right. It's a couple other directors. And George Lucas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Do you think so it'll live up to expectations? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. It, the, the pattern is so far that they they alternate good and bad ones. Mm. So maybe this will be the good one. <laughs> Have you tried using ChatGPT for your work research? Yes, I use ChatGPT kind of like once or twice a day uh, to, I feel like it's not interesting as artificial intelligence. It's not credible. Um, the only the only takeaway I get from, I, I feel like the narrative around ChatGPT is kind of silly. Uh, if it, I'm not, in, it doesn't make me impressed with ChatGPT's intelligence. It makes me unimpressed with how predictable humans are, that just a little bit of statistics on large data sets can so easily replicate all the drivel people spew out. Um, but it is a nice interface into the internet. So, um, you know, <clears throat> there's certain questions that are highly SEO spammed now, uh, if you search for them on Google. Mm -hmm. So like basic accounting questions, you know, I've been doing my 2022 taxes, which is always a miserable experience <laughs> and uh, frequently have to, you know, uh, get answers to things that have objective answers like mm -hmm. you know uh, how do you do this thing in zero or what's the correct accounting category for this sort of transaction and searching for stuff like that it's like uh, also excel uh spreadsheet formulas and stuff if you search mm -hmm. for that on the internet you will just get websites that only exist to lure you in via search engine optimization to show a page full of ads and somewhere buried deep in the text may be <laughs> the answer to your question chat gpt has read all of those pages and distilled the information. And so mm -hmm. you can just ask it and it will more or less give you a correct answer. Mm -hmm. um, and so I find it useful for that. Um, but uh, I, I don't sit around having conversations with it for fun. <laughs> uh, I think we had one final question. Uh, are you familiar with the Kinesis Advantage 2? Uh, no, not really. Uh, it's the board that kind of has the concave holes on either side. Yes. And you type. Is the uh, is it? It's I'm familiar with the Kinesis the keyboard. I don't know if is the two a new one. Uh, I think the two is just a more refined version. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so they're asking, do you think this would be considered as a wacky trend, and do you see it becoming more popular if the prices go down? Uh. 
I, so my intuition on this keyword has always been having, you know, with qualification that I have absolutely not looked into this, uh, is that it is, as with a lot of ergonomic keyboards, I feel like it is a manifestation of what Nassim Taleb would call naive rationalism. Uh, I think somebody decided, came up with what they think is ergonomic, but I'm not sure that they necessarily have a lot of research to prove that it is obviously superior. Uh, and that that is my intuition, having not looked into it at all. <laughs> um, and so as a result, I've kind of, you know, have historically always steered clear. Because, you know, Microsoft had a pretty popular ergonomic keyboard for a long time. And uh, it does come at a little bit of a cost. I find them a little bit more awkward to type on, actually. So if I'm going to retrain myself uh, in the name of, you know, improved wrist health or something, like I want to know that there's actually a, a rigorous sort of scientific study to show that um, it's better. Uh, and I don't know if that's true for any of these keywords. Uh, so perhaps some of you do. But. Um, I'm kind of pessimistic when it comes to typing habits. I don't think we're ever going to escape QWERTY until like the next big leap in how input devices are... You mean until we basically completed de completely departed yeah. from physical keyboards? Yeah, I, I think agree the next that. thing is just Neuralink or something like that. Yeah. Um, like people... No one wants to even move away from QWERTY. Uh, and then something like this is even like, it's even more of a jump. Like even if you can get keyboards like this for $10, I don't think we're gonna, I don't think anyone's willing to change decades of uh, muscle memory. Yeah, this is a, see, so this is another example of why Nassim Taleb's writing is applicable to everything. He, uh, <laughs> he has this concept which he refers to as the Lindy effect. Uh -huh. It refers to this, I think, a diner in New York City that has been around forever that is not particularly good, but it just continues existing because it has existed for a long time. And it's this general principle um, that the longer something has existed, the more you can reasonably predict that it the, that it will exist. So um, if uh, so the provocative example of this is like Kindles versus books. If we we're to go 200 years in the future, which do you think will exist, books or Kindles? Um, the Lindy books. effect would suggest that books are more likely to exist. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm probably not doing the best job of articulating it, but you can certainly look up that section of, uh, I think it's probably in the book Anti-Fragile, possibly the Black Swan. Um, and uh, I think that something like this probably applies to the ANSI keyboard layout. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that we can expect it to probably exist for a long time in certain applications, right? doesn't mean that it will be the dominant thing, but by virtue of its having existed, it is more likely to, uh, you know, persevere than be supplanted. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I think among programmers, for example, um, and people who do certain types of work, QWERTY keyboards will be around for a very, very long time. Yep. Um, and even, you know, uh, as a niche thing, it will probably continue to exist even after it's lived out its practical usefulness as with mechanical watches or film cameras, things like that. There are people who will have a nostalgic attachment to it and will just enjoy the exercise of doing it in this antiquated way. Mm -hmm. I probably will be one of those people. <laughs> yeah, I, I I, mean, I have personally tried to learn other layouts or you know, try all these wacky layouts that are more ergonomic and whatnot. And some of them I can see a reason for it, but then nothing else is adjusted for that. So I have to come up with ways workarounds to live with this new layout or new form factor so i even i ended up going back to qwerty just because it's more convenient <laughs> yeah for me at least this is uh this is one of the major themes of all of taleb's work is this this human impulse to hyper rationalize things and to want mm. the world to be ordered when the world is in fact extremely chaotic mm. and everything is the result of path dependency and history and um there is Humans cause a lot of unnecessary suffering for themselves by trying to stuff the messiness of reality into these sort of hard-edged boxes, right? Mm. Um, and I will confess that that ha has long been my impulse, right? I always like things to be perfectly sort of ordered and rationalized and organized in a certain way. It's part of my, you know, my maybe my training in sort of like logical philosophy and in sci the philosophy of science, and I just want everything to be a certain way. That's my normal you know, uh, way of dealing with the chaos and anxiety of existence. But um, a lot of Taleb's writing is, writing is like challenging that impulse and 
showing that in many cases it's actually not only not useful but counterproductive mm. yeah <laughs> okay I have a nostalgic attachment to you too <laughs> <laughs> I still remember the first time I met Juvies when was the first I I vividly remember the first time I met him I don't know if I told you that story I, I think it was at your house was that my house I think okay. you and Chubies had become friends or like gotten to know each other first. Okay. And then I happened to be over at your house too. Okay. And then that was the, I, was that the time that we went to Disneyland? No, I think this was Different. some, okay. yeah, this was okay. probably some NorCal meetup. Yeah. I, uh, I met him when I was going to the Pittsburgh meetup and I was oh, like okay. walking out of the front door of the hotel, having just checked in and somebody oh. was like, Norbauer, <laughs> is that you? <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Uh, which was the first time that had ever experienced uh, experience had ever happened to me, and we ended up <laughs> going to dinner and becoming very good friends. Um, before keyboards, what was your work? I've had uh, many things that I have done in the past. My first uh, so af first high school job was NASA, then I worked at the CDC doing uh, research in experimental psychology when I was in college. After that, I um, went to work for a member of the British Parliament as a foreign affairs um, researcher and speechwriter. I came back to the United States and started a startup, a web startup, sort of in the Web 2.0 era around 2004, 2005, uh, which was an online dating company, which I subsequently sold to OkCupid, which has now become part of Match.com. After that, I started a um, software consulting company specializing in Ruby on Rails. Uh, and then I started a little side business uh, called uh, Ruby Rags, which sold like t-shirts and apparel and other merch related to Ruby things. Uh, and then uh, after that, I started uh, dabbling, uh, intending to be sort of like retired and having fun. I started dabbling in industrial design related things like Star Trek props and keep customizing my own keyboards. And that accidentally became this business that I'm currently engaged in. Uh, what writings are you referring to? Nas Nassim Taleb? Uh, so uh, Nassim Taleb has a collection of writings that collectively are called um, the Inserto, uh, which yeah, is uh, refers to the fact that they, the, the overall theme is dealing with uncertainty. How do we make decisions when we don't know all the facts? And mm underscoring the fact that we usually don't know all the facts. Um, and within that book, there are several volumes. The first one is called Fooled by Randomness. The second one is called The Black Swan, probably his most famous book. Um, after that is, I think, a short book called The Bed of Procrustes, which is a, bu a bunch of short aphorisms. Then um, there is the um, Anti-Fragile, probably my favorite book in the series. And then after that uh, is Skin in the Game, and uh, there is a technical companion to the Inserto that goes deep into the mathematical, uh, the mathematics behind all of his ideas, which uh, is available for free on the internet. And he's currently working on a new book, which will become part of the Inserto series. And as wow. I mentioned, I've read all of them multiple, multiple times. <laughs> I really I like them a lot. There's something about his. So he's uh, he's from Lebanon, mm. not a native English speaker, and he has a, a very quirky way of writing that I just really really enjoy um oh, influences seneca yes of course in fact <laughs> that's why the keyboard is called the seneca he introduced ah. me to the philosophy of seneca ah. in in many ways you could argue that taleb's writing is especially in the book anti-fragile is fundamentally stoic in nature and he's obviously an explicitly a great admirer of the stoics and how they thought about risk randomness and uncertainty um and uh, of of the philosophers uh who are generally considered Stoics, Seneca is the one most interested in that sort of theme. And he is, in addition to being, I think, Taleb's favorite Stoic, he's certainly become mine as well, uh, which is why I've decided to name the first keyboard after. I would be down for a Mandelbrot next. Okay. Uh, he, he personally <laughs> knew and was was quite fond of uh, Oh, he personally knew Mandelbrot. I believe okay. so, yeah. Very fam uh, famous mathematician. Yes. And he talks a great deal about uh, Mandelbrot in uh, The Black Swan. And uh, sort of fractal, uh, fractal math was his mm -hmm. interest, right? Yep. All right. I think that's no more questions that I see. Uh, 
I apologize to everyone. I haven't been paying. I've been too busy <laughs> blabbering to pay close attention to what you've been saying in the chat. I no, that's fine. I've, I've been anyone. reading chat. So, uh, anyways. Oh, okay. One final one. Is there a place to get caught up on the announcements, Ryan? Huge fan. Have a Grail and a Norba Force from Mr. Gioren. Yeah. So the best place, honestly, to keep up with what I'm doing is to just go to my newsletter list. So you can sign up by going to norbauer.com slash list. Um, I ha technically have a Twitter account and I very occasionally post things to it, but I've always kind of hated Twitter. Um, and so I don't <laughs> do that as regularly as I should. You must hate it a lot right now then uh, <laughs> what musk is doing <laughs> i'm not i'm not sure that you could possibly have made it any worse so um uh i yeah i don't actually take a strong opinion on it i'm kind of like uh, neutral on the loving hating elon musk thing uh he's uh obviously a little nuts but <laughs> in some ways i think a little nuts is maybe what we need right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, the uh, norbauer.com slash list, you can sign up for my newsletter. I'm kind of like thinking, so I do, as I mentioned, I do all this reading all the time and I just don't really do anything with it. <laughs> um, and so I've been thinking about maybe sort of splitting my newsletter off into a here are keyboards you can buy newsletter and uh, here's my random thoughts newsletter. Um, you know, I, we've talked about doing a what, podcast or something. What um, might be cool is I'm guessing you take notes mm -hmm. on the books you read. Yeah. You can share that like Obsidian page or Rome Could research do. page. Could do. I would subscribe to that. So the volume is pretty high. I mean, <laughs> um, I would rather much read a condensed version <laughs> than the entire Sure. <laughs> <personally>. Well, <laughs> my idea was I would provide an even more distilled version where I'm okay. just kind of like giving you my take on the book in okay. you know, a few paragraphs. Or Norba News. Yes. Norba News, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I've thought about doing that, but if I do make such a thing, I would just announce it on my normal newsletter and have two separate ones. So uh, if you're interested, let me know. You can, you can always email me, ryan at norbauer.com, or sign up for the newsletter. Um, those are good ways. Uh, I know we've talked about maybe doing a podcast at some point. Mm. You know, I, I really, there are all these ideas that I love playing with and I find interesting that I encounter in my books or whatever, and I just... Not I pretty much keep them to myself, <laughs> but when I have conversations, it's really rewarding for me to have conversations with, you mm -hmm. know, friends like you and Preston and uh, uh, Jared, who works with me. And uh, whenever I go to keyboard meetups, this is usually what I talk with mm -hmm. people about. Like we don't end up talking about, you know, gasket Keyboards. mounting strategies <laughs> or whatever. You, we end up talking about philosophy or technology mm -hmm. or, you know, um, all these other things that I'm very passionate about. And I, I'd love to find some way of like connecting with other keyboard people around those shared interests. Yeah. But uh, I haven't quite worked out exactly the approach to do that yet we could maybe even implement offshoots of keep talk yeah yeah <laughs> or like non-keyboard categories on keep talk there i think those exist but uh, okay. they're not extensively used I'm, I'm sure there's a photography one. Oh, i have not seen that one i'll have to check it out yeah yeah i think uh huey created that because he's also uh, ah okay yeah ryan's also very active on keep talk we are also technically board members, right. <laughs> even though we don't do much. I don't know anybody's that active on Keep Talk, but it's my little refuge from the rest of the keyboard internet, which yeah. I <laughs> intentionally ignore. Yeah. All right. Well, that's been two and a half hours. We should probably let oh my. Norbar free now. But uh, once again, if you guys, guys thanks for checking out the video. If you guys weren't here in the beginning of the stream, um, the Norbar short film is already live on the Norbar YouTube channel. So go check that out to give him a subscribe. Do you have videos on there? I know there's a couple like... There's a few. Like tutorial videos on your products, but... The video of me that most people have seen is the one, your interview with me. Actually. Ah, okay, yeah. Also go oh. check out my interview with Ryan on my channel. One of my personal favorite videos. Uh, any parting words? Anything you want to plug for yourself? No, no parting words. <laughs> Thanks for watching my video. It's very self-indulgent <laughs> and whatever, but... Okay, one final one. What does Norbauer like hip-hop? Um, I can't say that I'm familiar enough with it to say either way, honestly. <laughs> I have uh, extraordinarily, embarrassingly limited musical tastes. Uh, I like. I really love the film Star Trek The Motion Picture. It came out in 1979 as an amazing musical score by Jerry Goldsmith. I've listened to that thousands and thousands of times. I put it on all the time when I'm working. And then like the next closest album is maybe one tenth of as much as that. And then the next closest album is one tenth of that. Um, I just, I listen to the same things over and over again. <laughs> All right. But yeah, that was um, our little hangout with Mr. Norbar. 
Make sure you guys subscribe to the newsletter to be notified of when his future projects uh, come to fruition. Join the uh, newsletter, norbauer.com slash list. Norbauer, only those things log logarithmically. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. Thank you. Oh, you like Chimin. I do, yes. I think Ooh, we were talking about this okay, maybe okay. on your last stream. Okay, okay. I'm a great, you know, medium BTS enthusiast. Okay, okay. It was Jared who mentioned that. He's nice, the one who nice, sort of got nice. me into it. There was a time when everyone who worked at Norbauer & Co. was some level of BTS enthusiast <laughs> because... Um, uh, you know, TJ mm -hmm. is very, very into BTS, and Jared, slightly so. And uh, it was so something that like kept him, kept me going through the pandemic. Was just like watching BTS videos because they're so over the top, ridiculous. Yeah. But yeah. Like All right. Yeah, that's it for this stream. Um, I guess we can raid someone. Do you remember what a raid is? I do remember what a raid is. Ooh, okay. I learned I will... that last time I was on your stream. Am I coming back tomorrow? I might not stream tomorrow. If I don't, I'll see you guys next week. Uh, if I do stream, I'll see you guys tomorrow. You can pick anyone from this list. I don't think any keyboard person is online right now. Well, who's this guy? Is he drawing? He, he is drawing, yes. I like drawing. That's awesome. I didn't know okay. people did drawing on Twitch. Okay. <laughs> I like his hair too. He's drawing on just paint. <laughs> we can get raid Mr. Uh, Peter Park. Peter Park. Okay. Yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Once again, if you haven't seen the premiere, it is live on Norbar's YouTube. And if you liked the soundtrack, also available to stream on Spotify. <clears throat> what board is he using? I'm not sure. Okay, I will start the raid now. I'll see you guys next stream. Bye-bye.